And we did have an executive session at 6 o'clock uh, to discuss the town manager's contract for the coming year. This is uh, tr uh, traditionally what we do. It's usually a little earlier in the year, but we're, we're going to get it done um, eventually. And we'll have a little bit of a discussion later on the agenda. Uh, the first item in the, on the agenda is always citizens' concerns. Any citizens with concerns that are not on the agenda are welcome to come to the microphone to share them. No citizens' concerns. All right. Next item is chairman's update. Um, there were a number of meetings. There were some meetings last week involving Peter Berry and uh, town manager and me with council and then with some Acton Water District reps to discuss the Nagog Pond appeal in preparation for settlement discussions, which we hope will happen maybe early next month. Um, before the discussions with Concord, um, we will probably have another executive session uh, for the benefit of the members of this board. Uh, this Thursday, May 25th at 6.30 in this room, there will be a public information session about the nuclear metal Superfund site cleanup. Uh, this is on Route 62 in Concord. Um, there will be representatives of the Environmental Protection Agency, the federal agency, and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. The focus will be on the so-called non-time critical removal action, uh, which is related to groundwater at the site. On Monday, next Monday, May 29th, 10 o'clock, is the Memorial Day observance, uh, which this year culminates at Woodlawn Cemetery. The parade starts at Acton Boxborough High School, proceeds up Hayward to Maine to the town center for a brief observance before uh, continuing to Woodlawn. On uh, next Wednesday, May 31st, 7.30 p.m., this room again, the Planning and Natural Resources Departments will be presenting a program on protecting open space via subdivision design. Uh, next Thursday, June 1st at 5.30 p.m. at Maynard Mill at Maine in Maynard. There's an open house about the proposed Acton Maynard uh, bike share program involving a company called Zagster, Z-A-G-S-T-E-R. Uh, Friday, June 2nd is the Acton Boxborough High School graduation and on the future agenda, June 5th, there is an application for a common victualler's license for the old Acton Coffee House location at Great Road in Maine, uh, which is notable for people like me who are in East Acton and don't haven't had a coffee place or any place to go uh, since Acton Coffee House moved to where else? West Acton, where everybody goes. So that's it, Mr. Manager. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, we just learned about uh, a quarter of six tonight that our uh, electric aggregation plan has finally been approved by DPU. Uh, I, I'm told by our consultant Peregrine that they, they approved everything except one element and the element they did not approve was the uh, uh, surcharge uh, on electric rates that would allow us to hire uh, a, an energy manager. Um, they felt apparently that since it wasn't in our initial um, uh, plan when we went to DOER, we put it in later, that they want us, if we want to pursue this, go through the whole process, amend the plan, go through public hearing, DOER again. So, uh, you know, we'll just move forward at this point and see, you know, just get, the, the main thing is get getting out to bid to get the electric rates, which at this point, I'm not sure this is the best time or not. So we're going to have to talk with the consultant and, and, um, and figure that all out. But at least the good news is we finally got the plan approved. Um, the highway department will uh, be going through some uh, um, some road reconstruction starting this Thursday, May 25th. They're going to uh, be working on Marion Road, Windmere Drive, Woodchester Drive, Central Street from Arlington Street to Mohawk Drive, Flint Road, Kelly Road, Nadine Road, Doris Road, Francine Road, Alcott Street, and Lexington Drive. It'll be involving grinding, leveling, raising of draining structures, and putting down a final course of pavement. Also, we were informed by uh, Mass DOT uh, that they are going to be doing an emergency culvert repair on Route 111 at the Acton Boxborough line tomorrow. Uh, so things may get a little disrupted there as well. And finally, just wanted to make the board aware we've, we've um, had some uh, new hires in the last couple weeks. Um, 
in the in the finance department in the in the collector's office uh, we have hired uh, Jashira Gonzalez um, uh, she uh, currently had, had, had been working from at John Dark Credit Union and also a volunteer income tax assistant tax preparer so she is replacing Amy Spinano who went to uh, work for the Westford Library and we've hired three new firefighter uh, EMT paramedics uh, Brett Lisak that started May 14th. He has um, been an LPN technician at UMass uh, Medical Center in Worcester and as well as a fire lieutenant and paramedic at the Uxbridge Fire Department. Peter Ballou, who started May 15th, um, uh, comes to us from community uh, EMS in Marlborough where he's been a paramedic since 2012 and also a call firefighter EMT paramedic for the town of Hopedale. And finally, Peter Imhoff, uh, who started May 16th, uh, has been working for the Cataldo Ambulance Service, where he was an EMTB and then became a paramedic in 2008. So these are three uh, critical hires as we get ready to implement uh, advanced life support on, uh, on July 1st. And that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Manager. And we have a few minutes before our first Appointments, so I'm going to run through the consent agenda um, rather than pick one of the other items. Um, consent agenda item 11 request to dispose of obsolete material at the memorial library. Item 12 request for full refund building department. Item 13 uh, re full refund is requested for the amount of $1,594.25. Item 13 committee appointment Dana Snyder Grant, associate to full member cemetery commission. Item 14, accept gift for recreation department, a gift of $500 from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare for funding a new recreation facility and playground at Jones Field. Item 15, accept gift for recreation department, a gift of $500 from Deborah's Natural Gourmet in West Concord to support the 2017 summer concert series and special events. Item 16, accept gift for recreation department, board to accept a gift of $500 from the Thoreau Club also in Concord, to support the 2017 Summer Concert Series and Special Events. Item 17, accept gift recreation department, a gift of $1,000 from Thomas A. Popson at Mortgage Network, Inc. to support the 2017 Summer Concert Series and Special Events. Item 18, board to accept contribution to the sidewalk fund from Summer Place Definitive Subdivision Number 16-15 as payment in lieu of construction. Item 19, one day spirit sampling license, Ducks Unlimited, Neshoba Sportsman Club, June 10, 2017. Night, item 20, one day alcoholic beverage license, Neshoba Valley Neighborhood Club, NARA, June 17, 2017. Item 21, one day alcoholic beverage license, Integrated Project Management, Inc., NARA, June 10, 2017. Item 22, one day alcoholic beverage license, Women, Boston Women's Rugby, NARA, July 22, 2017. Item 23, one day alcoholic beverage license, Patricia Connolly Nagog Clubhouse, May 26, 2017. Item 24, committee appointment, Benjamin Blumenthal, 348-364 Main Street Master Plan Committee, Act in 2020 Representative. Item 25, committee appointments, Emily Ying, Design Review Board, Planning Board Representative. Item 26, committee appointment, Bharat Shah, West Act and Sewer, Action Advisory Committee, Planning Board Representative. And item 27, use of life vote, pumper truck. Do motion, motion to approve consent agenda items 11 through 27. I'd like a, a question on sure. 27. On 27. What is that? Uh, if, if I might, um, uh, the state law changed recently uh, through the Municipal Modernization Act that it, it used to be you could, you could uh, um, borrow money for fire apparatus up to 10 years. Uh, the law changed to five years unless the governing body um, uh, uh, agrees that it, it, it has a useful life of 10 years. So when we went to town meeting uh, with the, an appropriation for the pumper truck this past April, all our numbers were predicated on a 10-year borrowing. So generally, fire trucks do tend to last that long, so it would be our recommendation for the board to uh, uh, state that the estimated life would be 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Joan, just uh, the protocol usually is if you have an item that you have a question about, you just say hold. And, and I mean, this happened to be at the very end of the list. So um, all you had to say is as soon as I read the item, say hold. 
and then what we do is we go back to the people who have held different items on the consent agenda to find out what the issue is. And if it's, it requires an amendment, then we hold those out and we approve all the other um, consent agenda items and then go, we approve the, the sort of the ones that involve a little work um, separately. And sometimes we end up uh, holding them and not voting on them until later. So, but that's usually what it is. So if you have something in future that you want to address or have a question about, just say hold as soon as I read the item and then we'll discuss it, so. But in the meantime, Katie has moved to approve all the consent agenda items. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Katie moves and Peter seconds. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining, thank you. Now, 710. The Acting Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing notice on May 8, 27, what? <laughs> May 22nd, is this the right one? Yeah, it's May, it should be May, was, uh-oh. It's correct, Okay, okay, okay. Let me start all over. The Acting Board of Selectmen hold a public hearing notice on May 22nd, 2017 at 7, 10 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room 204 at the Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton on the application of Costa Donuts 2, Inc., doing business as Dunkin' Donuts at 315 Main Street, Acton under Section 140 of the Massachusetts General Laws for a common victual or license. The application Applications or application can be inspected at town hall during normal business hours. Is there somebody here for Costa Donuts 2? No. All right. Do we want to just I'll make, approve I've been it? told this is just this is for the existing Dunkin' Donuts yeah. that moved um, from uh, the plaza with Not Your Average Joe's to the building next between Not Your Average Joe's and the Acton Medical Associates. Oh, um, oh. Yeah, and it was just that they moved and they need to update this. Um, so anyways, uh, with that, I will make a motion to approve the common victualler license for um, Costa Donuts, doing business as Dunkin' Donuts at 315 Main Street. Is there a second? Anybody? I'll, I'll, I'll second. I'll second the motion. I'll second. I okay, I so Katie, Katie moves and Peter seconds. That's actually a very popular location. I've noticed mm -hmm. that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Yeah, well, hold on. I thought they were saying this was a brand new license. It's not a renewal. It That's is because they it, had checked off because they moved. Maybe? Because they moved, so it's a different address, okay. right? So it's a new license. Okay. All right. I'm Are we fine. ready? Yeah. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstaining. Done. Uh, let's see. And it's a little bit early, but we can start by reading the notice. Um, and you folks, Mr. Brother Lamy and your your engineer, is that? Hi. If you if you you know you can speak there, or if it's easier, if you have you can sit there and use the mics there. Um, the Acton Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on May 22, 2017 at 7.15 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room 204 at the Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton on the application of Autoplex 1 LLC for a site plan special permit 303-31-17-465 under zoning bylaw section 10.4 at 76 Powder Mill Road, Acton. The applicant proposes to expand the existing building. The application and accompanying plans can be inspected at the planning department in town hall during normal business hours. And I am the assigned selectman on this uh, site plan. It's, this is really, this is Acton Ford, the current Acton Ford uh, business. Uh, they're proposing basically to um, r remove some paving that's in the back of the building. Uh, and re expand the existing building uh, to create more space, uh, basically some bays, I guess. So, uh, and we have comments from various departments, planning, engineering, and the water district as well, and the design review board. So I guess if uh, you wanna introduce yourselves and just do an overview of, in greater detail, um, that would be great. Do you, you have to, you, can you use that mic or do we have the handheld mic? I don't, you're gonna, it's awkward. Um, I'll try to speak into it if I can. My name is Molly Obendorf, I work with Stamsky McNary and this is Leo Bertolami. The project address is 76 Powder Mill Road and I will walk you through the proposed work and site. 
Yeah, make sure, make sure that the mic. So the project location is 76 Powder Mill Road, and the property fronts on High Street here and abuts the Assabet River, and the Assabet River is associated mean annual high water line, projects a 200-foot riverfront area onto the property shown here. The existing building is surrounded by existing pavement, and the modest proposed addition is squaring off the building in the back. And from a stormwater perspective, this is an improvement to the site. Um, roof runoff is clean, whereas parking lot runoff is not. And we are eliminating 12 parking spaces. However, there is a surplus of parking, uh, vehicular parking spaces um, existing on the property where it's not an issue. And this was it's gone through a full uh, staff review, and we've taken the comments into consideration. And we will revise the sewer connection and the dumpster location and we would like to discuss the sidewalk with you. And I know, I know Conservation Commission reviewed this because it is within their jurisdiction, both the 100-foot buffer zone and the 200-foot uh, river, river bank or riverfront uh, zone, and they, they issued their decision in December, an order of conditions. So um, are there questions, comments from the board, Peter? Uh. If you're not going to connect up to the sewers, are you keeping the septic system then? Is that what happens? The, the septic system will be connected to the sewer. Um, we were asked to oh, not, okay. not connect the floor drains to the sewer. So okay. that will be revised. So you, these are going to be bays for repairing vehicles. That's and correct. you already have those there. And there's some, just for my own information. So what do you do with the oil and the, and the gas and other you know, effluents that come out of the bays? You have some in-ground. Yep. Uh, capture of those? And, yep, they go okay. through a floor drain and they're captured in an MTC gas trap and from the gas trap they are put into a tight tank and that tight tank is pumped um, very often. Quarter. Quarter, every quarterly. 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 Okay. Um, and I think there was, was it the design review board that suggested that you do something with the landscaping, clump it together as opposed to spread it out or something um, like yeah, that? Yeah, there is a landscaping okay. plan. There was a change going on, Grover. Yes. So essentially we will just be replacing the existing plants um, with an abundance of more plants, trees, shrubs, um, you know, various locations, they're spread out. Um, I think there was about six or seven before, and there's a bunch more now. I think the design review board asked if we could bring them together on each side, which we did, and um, Holly asked if we could change the species and on one, and we said we'd do what was ever in the uh, comment to the board of selectmen. Okay. So if it's there, we'll do it. If it's not there, we'll do as uh, the plan states. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I would just add that the, the, the species, the specimen, it was a pear tree that apparently exudes a really offensive odor. I guess it's very popular because it's very hardy. But, it, yeah, it, and, and there were some, you know, slang terms for what the tree smells like, which I will not go into, but <laughs> it is pretty offensive. And Holly just suggested that you find something that's equally hardy, decorative, but without the smell, but anyhow. So, Katie. And we uh, called Randy, the landscape architect, and told him to make the changes, and if he had any questions, just email Holly. So that's already been done. Great. Katie. Um, yeah, my own, well, I had two questions. My silly question was that there, there, the changes on the interior, um, there was something that was just labeled Dave's office, I think was his name. I was just curious about who he was because he had this really big, there were like all other things that were for specific, you know, uses or whatever. And then I, I can't remember if it was Dave or Dan or somebody like that. So that was my silly question um, about who Dave is and why he has such a big office. <laughs> is, is that on the architectural floor plan? Yeah, it was in the floor plan inside. <laughs> yeah. 
It, it doesn't really matter. I was just curious when I was looking at it. He wasn't on the original, on the current state. It might not be Dave. I might have gotten his name wrong. There's that big one in the middle there. Uh, David. David, yeah, see? Yeah, David's office, David. yeah. Do you know who David is, Leo? David's my partner. He's your partner. Okay. I am the president of Acton Ford. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and we own the Autoplex Group. Right. I do, but I don't spend that much time but there. David so does. Okay. David is the managing partner, and no, that's just... David's office. No, I don't have one. There. Well, he got a nice Actually, upgrade. I do, but I don't use it. <laughs> well, David got a nice upgrade in this change, so that's good. Um, no, and my only question was you had mentioned the, the sidewalk contribution, um, and this might be a question actually for planning. So when the building was initially built, was there a sidewalk was there a contribution to the sidewalk fund, or why are we asking for one now when there's sort of no building along a new frontage? Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that question, if there was one originally, but this building was constructed um, quite a long time ago. Do you, I don't know if Leo remembers, but we could look into that. Um, in the past, the Board of Selectmen, for an example with the Hearts Corporation, mm -hmm. when there's been minor amendments or changes to a site, um, and there is no sidewalk along the frontage or in a situation where, um, you know, they could add one um, and they didn't previously add one, then it's basically put into our comments for the Board of Selectmen's consideration. Okay. And, and the calculation was based on the entire frontage of the building as opposed to just the addition? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Leo, do you remember if there was a previous sidewalk contribution? <sighs> I think the lady next to you would know if that's <laughs> that was so <laughs> Welcome back, Joan. I, I don't remember. The original site plan on that project was done in 1975, yeah, and I was not the owner. Not. Okay. Um, and yeah, we didn't have a sidewalk situation in those Yeah, places. you're right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say probably not. Okay. But what I can say, if you want to take the comment now or later, I've pretty much sidewalked that whole area. So mm. if you look across the street to Acton Ford, the sidewalk comes out of the Dunkin' Donuts, goes right down the front of Powder Mill Plaza, then it crosses over to the Acton Ford property, then it takes the corner to go across Route 62. It connects out to the bridge, then I laid the sidewalk on the canoe landing, which I leased to the town, and I laid the sidewalk on the Quick Lane building, which was right across the street. So there's plenty of sidewalk um, there for people to walk it, and they do. And I feel on this particular project, if we want to go there right now, that it's such a less than a 3,000 square foot addition. We'd like to donate $5,000 to the sidewalk fund. And when we do the big addition, we'll donate whatever we need to. But there's plunty of pedestrian access from Dunkin' Donuts all the way to pretty much Main and Supply, because I did it when I did the Prescott building. We had that wide open. And the Board of Selectmen did not want a sidewalk that was, would disrupt the traffic flow. Uh, there is some up by the air vent for the system in front of the Prescott building as you head towards Maynard, but that's all. So once again, I believe there's plenty of pedestrian accent, uh, access, and if you want to take and walk it sometime, I'd love to, but we don't mind doing 5,000 on a small addition, but we do plan to do a bigger addition, and if a bigger addition generates you know, that type of money, we'd be more than happy to pay it. But on this one, that's where we stand. OK, thank you. Sure. Joan, anything? Um, I would just note that typically um, we can waive, well, we have the sidewalk requirement. And if the sidewalk isn't built, then we usually ask for a contribution, um, which is a charge of $50 a linear foot, um, which in this instance, at least planning has done one calculation that would come up to about $44,000. Uh, which is a big, you know, kind of a leap from the $5,000 that you're talking about. Um, uh, and then the other thing that um, we have a requirement of is uh, when we have car parking, we typically require one bike parking slot per 20 vehicle spaces. And so on your property, that would mean nine bike Parking spaces. That will be addressed also. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have, I forgot we have to no mention problem that. With that. That will be addressed. Yes. Okay. We've been doing that on every project now. Okay, so experience. so we need we need to come to terms about the sidewalk. Okay, the if side I could make a comment in regards to yep. the sidewalk, the address of Acton Ford is 76 Potter Mill Road. So in my opinion, it takes up Route 62 frontage, which is only about 100 feet. Uh, even if we could put a sidewalk in, you would never be able to put one in on High Street. 
So realistically, we're talking about a 100 lineal foot long sidewalk, not an 800 one. And the $5,000 figure, I believe, is very fair. But when we do the large addition on that building next year, we'd be more than happy to, you know, do what the board wants. I mean, we're talking about a 10,000 square foot addition coming up in the future. So, I mean, that would warrant it. But this is less than 3,000 square feet. All right. Mr. Barry, do you have any comments about that as a sidewalk committee liaison? Um, well, we, we have uh, in the past um, accepted less than the full amount. Um, I don't know about the $5,000 figure. Uh, it is true that there are, there is a sidewalk all the way up, going up uh, High Street, and pretty soon it will connect all the way to Main Street. Um, it's being built, the infill sections are being filled in now. Uh, I'm not sure about 62. You say in front of your quick stop, you built a sidewalk. I built a sidewalk in Does front of the quick stop. Does that go to Sudbury Road on that side? Yes, that street? goes. Okay. Well, what, I've, what we've done is we've taken the one for the canoe landing, and we've carried that as far as we could do it. I put one in front of On Silver the other Road. side. Okay. On the other side, I okay. put one all in front of 60, 60 Potomac Road, which is probably 145, 150 feet. I've sidewalked 60 four is Moscarellos or what? You're talking about which I don't own Moscarellos. Quick Lane, the one you originally saw. Okay. So okay. I, I sidewalked oh, So all you of did that. one on the, on the canoe landing. Canoe and, landing. And the Quick Lane. Okay. In the Quick the Lane, in okay. Subaru, and the okay. edge of Prescott Paint. And the reason why I didn't go all the way down Prescott Paint, as I stated before, is the selectman at the time did not want to, you know, put a channel blocking that because people yeah. would be driving over it. But we did do it down at the end by the... I think there is a sidewalk on the other side of 62 there in front of uh, the Pontiac. It actually goes up Sudbury Road. You know, one of the purposes of the sidewalk fund is not only to get sidewalks built along the frontage, but the if there's already sidewalks there, we require contributions to our fund so we can okay. build sidewalks in other areas of the town. So sure. that's the, one of the reasons why we have this requirement. Um, you know, it's five thousand dollars enough. I guess I, I. Peter, what would you like? Ten. <laughs> if you want ten thousand dollars, I'll give you ten thousand. All right. Well, uh, let's, that'd be my recommendation. Would, okay. Yes. So we'll compromise on that and say a ten thousand dollar contribution to the sidewalk. Um, and uh, are there any other any other concerns, questions that people want to address? Do we have a? Um, I would suggest the addition. I didn't see reference in, in some of the language that planning board had talked, planning department had talked about, but uh, about the design review board uh, landscaping suggestions of clustering the plants, and and also about this pear tree issue. But it, you know, I think that there was a comment that the DRB made in its uh, recommendations that the the proponent had already agreed to adopt those those uh, recommendations, so it's just a matter of memorializing it um, in our decision, in our, you know, conditions somewhere. So that would be something that I would suggest uh, we include in, in the final decision if it isn't in, in there in the draft right now. So I just, okay, comments from the audience, and we have Ms. Friedrichs, yes. Uh, you know, if we, I, I just want to, I had a question for Kristen, but I don't know, if we can hear Ms. Frederick's first. I just, okay. I don't know in terms of the water how you want to do it, but I do have a question for Kristen. Go ahead, Tara. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Hi, Leo. Um, just my opinion, but if someone says that their bottom line is 5,000 and they pretty readily give you 10,000, you can probably get 20. <laughs> But I, either way, I think that um, if Leo's offering to pay the whole $44,000, that um, I think that we should get that in writing. Um, and then I was wondering, Leo, what, uh, what do you charge the town for the canoe landing, out of curiosity? I don't remember what the figure was. Uh, they were going to take care of the insurance and do something very minimal. And I have not charged the town not a nickel in the last 15 years that it's been done. Thank you. And I've insured it also. It has not. This town, I believe, is self-insured, so it would have been automatically covered, but I insured it Thank also. you. Um, and the last thing was that um, there's a lot of people that cross from the Toyota 
to the other side. And more than once, um, I had to break because they kind of dove out into the road. And I'm wondering if it's time for a crosswalk there. There's a lot of people that cross. Thank you. I know what you're asking for, but I didn't understand the first part of it. There's a lot are of Are you talking about, about Subaru? Or are you talking uh, about sorry, Subaru? Toyota, yeah. oh, Toyota Subaru. Subaru. Yeah, little yes, this, um, uh, I've, more than once I've, I've had oh, a break wait. for people that are walking okay. across that road. And one time it was a person with a stroller. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to talk about 61 Pottermill Road, Subaru? I'd be more than no, happy if you want no, to. It's a that's, different lot. That's, that's, yeah, it's a different, that's a different day, a different discussion. So, yeah, Just, thank you. Okay. Anybody else from the audience have comments about this project? Concerns? All right. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't see a comment from the sidewalk committee, uh, Kristen. So do you know if they didn't get asked or if they didn't have time to meet? Or? We, didn't, we didn't receive any, at least from what I know. So I haven't seen any come into planning or, well, they don't have access to Munis, so I haven't seen anything come into planning. Okay, do we have do we need further Should discussion or somebody want to make a motion? Oh, well, I'll make a motion to close the hearing. Okay. Katie's move to close the hearing. Does somebody want a second? Second. Uh, Joan seconds. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Hearing is closed. Now discussion. I'm or, fine with the ten thousand dollar donation. Um, so I'd make a motion to approve the site plan special permit uh, with the with the ten thousand dollar donation to the sidewalk fund. Um, adding a condition that they meet the design review board recommendations and landscaping. I can't remember if this was in the decision or not already, but not connect the drains. Um, I think that, yeah, that was a, that okay. was addressed. So that's just those two. So, yeah. Somebody want a second? Second. Joan second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. We're Thank done. you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back, Joan Gardner. Take care. I am going to skip over because our next uh, appointment is not until 8 o'clock. And I'm going to uh, Selectman's Business Item 8, Board to Sign Tax Increment Finance Agreement with Insulate Corporation. Uh, we just received the, the final draft, uh, and maybe, Mr. Manager, you'd be willing to go through what has happened since, I guess, we last talked about this. Yes, thank you. Uh the, the main uh, thing, I think, to point out in the agreement, I mean, as, as you recall, town meeting approved the tax, in <laughs> tax increment plan um, in April at, at annual town meeting. Um, but one of the big discussions we've, we've had with Insulet, and John Narkom is here from Insulet um, this evening, uh, was the, the issue of, uh, I get it, what, what is commonly known a clawback, which means basically if they don't meet some of their employment projection that they would reimburse the town um, for some of the taxes that uh, a taxman have, they have received. So uh, in the agreement, um, section six I think it is, uh, shows that if in fact, um, the, the, if insulate um, in their manufacturing positions uh, uh, fall below 250 um, employees in manufacturing. Uh, years one through five, they would pay back cumulatively 100% of, of the tax benefit they received. Years six through 10, they would pay 75% of the cumulative tax benefits they received. Years 11 through 15, 50% of the cumulative taxes, and year 16 to the end, 20, be 25% of the cumulative taxes. We had a meeting, geez, I can't remember, we had so many meetings last week, Janet, uh, but we, we met with the insulate folks and, and Janet and myself, uh, town council and Selby to, to work out um, uh, this issue. So I think we're, 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 we're very happy with your agreement and uh, would recommend that the board sign it. Uh, comments, questions from the board? Katie. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, first of all, I understand the need, you know, for negotiations and, and the timing issue of this, but I'm not super thrilled that we saw this 20 minutes before our meeting started and it hasn't been 
posted publicly or you know reviewed by the EDC or anything like that, um, considering that there are some changes from the draft that um, was presented to the EDC and, and that you know we took to town meeting. I'm okay with the clawback um, kind of mirroring the TIF in terms of you know only clawing back X percent if it's a you know less if, if they stay for longer. But my concern in here and and I'm we can talk about the 250. I'm I, I'm somewhat comfortable with that. But my concern in here is that. They never say that they will get up to a thousand jobs, and in fact, it says that within the first five years. I'm just trying to find the page again. I haven't been able to spend a ton of time with this. Um, it it's, says, I think it's paragraph four on page four. I'm looking at it. Thank you. Um, yeah, it says that they will get to 750 full-time employees within five years. We took to town meeting a thousand employees. If you look at the documentation in their local incentive application. Everything in here says 500 employees, or 1,000 employees, everything in here, um, including the letter that you know, we authorized you to send, um, Steve, um, to the state, including yeah, every, every part of their application says that they will have 1,000 employees, um, 500 new jobs, and 500 jobs that they're moving over from Bill Ricca. And so I guess I'm really confused um, and not frankly comfortable signing this document where it only talks about 750 employees. And if we're doing the clawback at 250, I'm not sure why then they're not even agreeing to getting up to 1,000, which is what they've told us all along. So I don't know if you or if John can address that. Um, but, but frankly, at this point, I'm, I'm not I'm not comfortable approving this document saying 750 full-time employees within five years. When, well, I, when I stood up in front of town meeting and said 1,000 employees. And again, I understand negotiations, and I can see that you know with the, with the clawback, um, but I'm really not, I'm not thrilled with that. And I don't, you know, I don't know the reason, es especially you know, if I was the state looking at this you know, and saying, well, why is everything in here, you know, every letter and every form you filled out say you're going to add 1,000 jobs, but then your agreement with the town only says 750 jobs. So what's the discrepancy? Well, I, I could defer to John. I think some of it is the distinction between manufacturing jobs and kind of their, their E&D front office uh, jobs. But I don't, John, if you want to speak to that. Yes, I think the um, early on in the process when we applied and we're talking about a thousand, we weren't aware of the clawback at a hundred percent over twenty years. So if we were in violation at any point over twenty years, uh, we knew we understood there was a clawback. But essentially, to us, technically, we could be out of compliance in year nineteen. Mm -hmm and never, never reap the benefits of an incentive. So we thought that was with 100% clawback and maintaining 100% for those first five years uh, for the town to take under consideration that um, business things could happen, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's a cure for diabetes. We just thought with us having to accrue and reserve those funds every year, we would not realize any incentive. Mm -hmm. So to protect us and allow to, you to have 100% claw, claw back over those key years, which was the first five years, we wanted to protect ourselves in the event that something happened. That's why we lowered it to 750. So I'm fine, and again, I'm fine with that, with uh, doing the 100% in the first five years and the 75, you know, in the out, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. bumping it down in, in outer years. I think that makes a lot of sense, because as you said, otherwise, you know, you really, you'd have to just hold that money aside in case something happened. Sure. Um, that's fine. Um, but in here, the clawback only happens if you drop below 250 employees, so it's not even the 750. Um, and again, that, that's okay. But I think my concern is that at the beginning here, it, it then references only going up to 750 employees and not the 1,000 employees that we were 
um, that we were told. So it says, because their base employment level, it says that you'll increase 750 full-time employees over the base employment level, which started January 1st, 2017. As far as I know, you have zero employees January 1st, 2017. So it would be 750 employees um, in, in Acton. Um, so I, I, it's that paragraph that I don't, I don't understand why it's 750 and not 1,000 when the clawbacks related to the 250 full-time employees. Well, again, I think to protect the 100% the, the um, to the town, uh, you know, clawback of, of, of all the funds in those first five years, which we wasn't our understanding of the clawback. We didn't have the details of the clawback at, the, at this point. Um, when we found that out, um, in, in order for us to agree to, to claw back or give back the entire amount over those first five years, uh, we thought 750 was a reasonable number as a compromise. But, but the claw back is not 750, it's 250. Well, the number of jobs that we would bring in the first five years right, it's into, two, into Acton. No, it, it says here in section six that in, in addition, in the event that the EACC certifies a project and in connection there with the company has failed to increase the number of full-time employees by at least 250 full-time employees over the base employment level, which is zero, um, or if it's fallen below 250 full-time employees and the company shall reimburse the town in the amounts, you know, again, 100% in the first five years. So that's two, it's if you fall under 250 employees that you, the clawback would take effect. It has nothing to do with the 750. And so my, I just don't know why then we're saying now we're not even going to go up to 750 when, or 1,000, when we were told 1,000 and when everything in your, the rest of your applications is 1,000. So I guess, you know, my question is just, is your intent still to go to 1,000? And if it's not, then I have concerns because I'm not comfortable with this application, you know, saying 1,000 employees all throughout it. Um, but our TIF not, not saying that anywhere. Yeah, no, we, we're very, very confident. In fact, we just got a uh, significant amount of money approved last week by our board of directors for additional uh, work to be done on the site over the 140 million. So um, we are, we're very confident that, um, you know, and have every intention of expanding even, even you know, the, uh, uh, the manufacturing operations on site. The reason for the 250 was because in the event that there was a business uh, circumstances that happen, whether it's an acquisition, the likelihood that the manufacturing would stay is very high. Right. It's a unique operation. In an acquisition scenario, uh, nobody's likely to move this facility with the amount of investment that we've made. There is a, the possibility that, that in an acquisition that some of the headquarters people, some, a portion, or all of them could be consolidated regionally or to, into some other area. But we feel very confident that the, you know, the manufacturing employees um, would not be moved because they're not going to, there's nowhere to consolidate to. It's a very unique um, uh, device. Okay, well then, I, and again, I'm comfortable with the 250 employee level being the level for the clawback. I'm just concerned about this page four paragraph four under company investment where it says that it essentially says that you're only going to increase thing that you intend by December 31st, 2023 to increase by or to 750 full-time employees. I want that number to say a thousand. It doesn't affect your claw, the clawback provisions and it just clarifies and codifies in there that you've made a commitment to get up to a thousand employees and that that's what's reflected in your application to the state um, and, in, and in what we presented to town meeting. Um, again, it, it doesn't impact the clawback in any way, but I'm not comfortable approving it at 750 because it's not, it's not what we agreed to, it's not what I feel like town meeting agreed to, and it's not what's reflected in the rest of your application. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't affect your clawback and it doesn't harm you in any way. And so I guess I'm just, I'm saying I would like to see that number change, and if it's not, I don't, I don't think I'll be supporting this. I'm a very big supporter of the TIF. I, I presented it at a town meeting. I, I you know, was happy to sell it, but 
I don't, I'm not okay with this change to 750. Somebody else, comments, questions from the board? Peter, Joan. I mean, I just, I guess I'm inclined to uh, agree with Katie. I, from the time I first heard presentations from you folks, it was you're going to bring a thousand jobs to active. I see a letter here from your uh, senior vice president, or let's see, senior vice president and CFO says the company estimates that it could relocate up to 500 Massachusetts-based employees to Acton and hire an additional 500 new full-time positions at the Acton facility. So the, kind of the thousand number has been ingrained in people's mm -hmm. minds since this was first proposed. And, yeah, yeah. and I agree with Katie, if you say a thousand in that paragraph four, which was your original commitment, it doesn't change the fact that 250 is what governs the clawbacks. The 250 number of jobs governs the clawbacks, as I read it. But so, yeah, uh, I, I had thought we had negotiated this with the with the group, but understand that you know this is the the final uh, you know final approval that we need here. Again, er we have every intention. Uh, we just got 35 million dollars approved last week for our board of directors to put in additional uh, space for an additional line. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the 250 people that we had was originally for two lines, capability to put in a third line, but we now have the capability to put in a fourth line. So, it, believe me, we're committed to acting. Um, this was, you know, worked out in a, in a negotiation that we had on the TIF agreement with Selby and, and, and some of the town members. I, can I can I make a point first before we go further? I made I was talking to you before the meeting started about the difference between decertification and clawback, and and council separated those two things because we were kind of getting hung up on them both being together. You decert and then you clawback, and he made the point, and that's why you have two different standards potentially for decert. You could decert if they drop below 750 technically, uh, and if you decert, if you get the decert order, order, then immediately, assuming that they've built the new building, then we start to charge them taxes at the elevated level. You know, they don't get the, the tax the tax relief that they've been getting under would be have been getting under this agreement. The clawback is just additional relief beyond the decertification and, and the ability to charge taxes at the higher appraised value. So I, I just want to make sure that you're not overlooking that when you decertify um, there's a benefit. And I understand um, that 1,000 was thrown around a lot. Um, and as you, you yourself acknowledge, there are compromises that you make. Um, mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, there was some misunderstanding about the clawback provision. And frankly, uh, some of the discussion earlier that I heard <coughs> was really uh, uh, from, you know, insolent side, uh, it was just much more severe. Um, this is at least allowing us more or less the same format that we had agreed upon with only the reduction to 750. I mean, there were some other alternative proposals that would have been completely unacceptable, I think, to the town. Um, they would have been much more draconian and, and put a lot more of the risk on the town and basically no risk at all on, on the company. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I understand the difference. I understand that the thousand would now, if we change 750 to thousand, would be the level for decertification. But decertification is also a statewide process, and it says in here that there has to be a public hearing before the board of selectmen in which we consider things, you know, that would affect the company and other issues of the things that you brought up. So it's not as though it's not the automatic, like the clawback, you know, is, is more. It's not automatic at all. Um, and it and it's part of a state process that the EACC would have to decertify the, pro the project as well. And again, in the application, it would be different to me if their application to the Commonwealth said 750 employees, but their application to the Commonwealth for um, the uh, it's not for the TIF at that point, but your your application for um, uh, whatever the local incentive program says five hundred or says a thousand employees in it. So it's it just brings both of these into line with each other and makes them you know make makes them meld with each other. But otherwise, you're saying to the state, hey give us this benefit because we're going to bring a thousand jobs, but you're only saying to the town, oh, but we're only willing to say it's going to be 750. And I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. And we've, 
you know, sent letters saying that it would be a thousand jobs, an anticipated thousand jobs. And again, it's it's not an automatic. There's a process to go through where they would have to be decertified at the state. We'd have to have a public hearing. We would talk about the issues and you know um, things of that nature that that you know may have affected the inability to get up to a thousand jobs. But I'm you know they've made a commitment to do that. This is what we told town meeting. Um, we were pretty clear on that front, and that's because Insulet's been pretty clear, and it sounds like you still are pretty clear that you're going to bring a thousand jobs, and you're pretty clear to the state that you're going to bring a thousand jobs here. So I just want that to be the same, and I don't think it makes sense to have in the. I mean, this TIF goes to the state as well, and I don't think it makes sense for, on the one hand, one part of your application to say a thousand employees, and another part to say 750. Um, no, I, I could be mistaken because I I'm not an expert on 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 the either uh, incentive, but I don't think we said we were bringing a thousand jobs to the state. I think we said we we're hiring 600, roughly 600. I don't remember I, the exact number. I mean, number. the applications in here say fi moving 500 um, permanent full-time employees to be transferred from other Massachusetts site or project location 500. Total permanent right. full-time existing jobs retained at project location 500, which adds up. As far no, as but I, I thought you had said thousand. we were bringing a thousand. Sorry, jobs I, to the I state. mean overall a thousand jobs to Acton, okay, okay, moving okay. 500 of them from Bill okay. So, but that's what the application to the state says throughout it um, is a thousand jobs. Every document in here um, from Steve, from Insulate, from you know ever everything in here on multiple forms references a thousand jobs. And it doesn't make sense to me that then our one document says nothing about a thousand jobs. So again, if you know, if it's I'm just saying where I stand. I, I can't support it with seven fifty because I got up and and told town meeting that it was gonna be a thousand jobs. <laughs> People aren't going to consider you a liar. I don't care. You know, it's not I mean, about I know you are. You know, your full, faith, your full faith and credit is, you know, was that's was part right. of that. But that's one number, and it's a projection. I mean, Steve's letter to, in March says that it's estimated 1,000 jobs within five years. I mean, it's 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 a rough, uh, you know, it's a ballpark range, and and it's got to be flexible and. Honestly, as I said, um, given what some of the alternative proposed compromises were, this was uh, pretty palatable. Um, it may not be palatable to you uh, because you want everything consistency, but there's a saying about consistency or something. <laughs> and, um, that's fine. If you're comfortable with it, that's okay. I'm just stating. But, but the trouble is, if you're not if you're not going to vote to support it, that's a problem. And Peter seems to be um, just sort of lined up with you. Um, so. Anybody? So anybody it, it, Go ahead. Is there any other number other than a thousand? I mean, do you want to negotiate? I, I, I don't. I, I mean, you put but in your had, application to the state had. that you're going to do a thousand jobs. And, and again, this isn't related to a clawback at all, and it's not a guaranteed or a, you know, you go below, don't get to a thousand that we're decertifying you. But if you say to the state that you're going to do a thousand jobs and enact in, and the, the state is part of the decertification process, then it just makes sense to me that they're anticipating that it be a thousand jobs as well. So, you know, I'm just not comfortable saying to the ACC it's a thousand jobs, but then saying to us it's 750. It, it, it doesn't, I, I'm sorry, but that doesn't feel very transparent either. Cause I, you know, I'm not gonna be there when you make your presentation to, uh, um, to the ACC either, you know, and, and I imagine it will be, you know, that because that's still your plan by the sounds of it, that you're going to bring a thousand jobs to Acton, um, which is a great plan and I'm very supportive of it and I'm happy to give you a pretty large tax break to do that because I think it's a really great contribution to our town. Um, but I just want that to line up with what is being pitched to the state and what's being pitched to us. Um, and I'm uncomfortable that it's different, and I'm uncomfortable about the change. I'm again. I think that we're pretty uh, being pretty forgiving on the on the clawback. When frankly, it you know, again, I, there clearly was a misunderstanding. I think we understood there'd be a bigger clawback, and you know, it. it but we were willing to move on that and, and give what I think is a pretty generous, you know. Um, 
clawback provision in there where we're not saying we're going to take it all back if you don't meet the, you know, if you don't get to 1,000. We even brought it down to that 250 that you're really confident that you're going to keep, um, you know, regardless of what happens. So I think that the town has moved a lot on that, and I think that that's fair, and, and to me it's, I'm only comfortable with 1,000, but okay. I'm um, only Katie, I'm going to ask, give John a moment to explain to us what happens if you don't get an approved TIF tonight. Well, if we don't get an approved TIF, um, the deadline uh, is uh, the 24th, which is uh, two days from now. I think the electronic filing has to be tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. Um, and then there's some question about the uh, the base setting the base for the um, for the for the for the commencement for the commencement year whether it's a which was agreed upon between Insulate and the town that it would be this roughly the six million dollar valuation but apparently with the assessments due on July 1st that what was com what was communicated and agreed upon between the town and Insulate was the six million would be in a reassessed value, apparently the reassessed value would be the purchase price, which would be the nine million, and the agreed upon amount between the town and Insulate would no longer hold true. So we're under a bit of a. We have to get this uh, submitted uh, by tomorrow evening electronically. So that. And obviously, if you have an in dramatically increased assessed value potentially, then that kind of messes up. A lot of the financing so yeah it does it sets the base higher and again the town and, and insulate had agreed upon you know so. mr. manager any words of wisdom I still feel pretty good with this I understand what Katie's saying but um, you know we're still increasing significant jobs, and uh, you know, I mean, the clawback was it was hotly contested, and we had to get a compromise to get this done. Anything else from the board for now? Okay, audience members. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Got a couple of questions. Does this take a supermajority? No. So, how many do you need without Katie? So, but Peter's leaning that way. I, I just really want to thank you guys for your level of integrity. Um, as much as we want the company, um, this is, I have a, a lot of experience in business, and it's a normal thing to squeeze um, authorities to put them in a position where they've got a compromise. And so I appreciate your integrity. Um, I'd like to know, did you agree to the Eight o'clock start time for the residents on the noise. That's what I would like to know. I. <laughs> well, this is the insulate application, right? Yeah, that's a site plan. This is a different issue. I'm sorry, but I'd yeah. like to know um, if we're, you know, putting our integrity on the line. Uh, if they were willing to agree to what the residents wanted, or not, I would like to know that. It was one. It was one resident, and and no, we didn't. Um, the final, we just, the, the final site plan just got signed today, so it'll be on the website. So I want to thank you for holding firm on, on this issue. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience? No? Okay. Okay, we have to come to a decision, and I guess we're going to have to vote uh, if there's no further discussion. Um, does somebody want to make a motion to approve the TIF? Does somebody I mean, want well, that, I mean, I don't know that that's, that's not on the, the table because we have to either approve the, the, the version that's here or not. Okay, I, I got to say I am um, not happy that this came to us with no time to review it either. Um, but uh, understanding the constraints on the time here and trusting the process of the negotiations between our council and Insulates Council and town manager and um, the land use director and I guess Janet as chair was involved in these negotiations. No, I was, I was a potted plant. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was came in just for that one meeting last week, so. I, I, I don't see this as saying they won't bring a thousand jobs. They're committing 
and, and John, you signing a document that says you will bring a thousand jobs and then turning it into 750, I mean, all of that troubles me considerably. Um, but given the circumstances, I'll move that we approve the agreement. Somebody want a second? Oh, thanks. I have a question. What is the vote necessary? Yeah, it's majority. It's not super majority. Is anybody second? Okay. If you're not going to second, I'll second. Okay. Okay. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yay. Abstaining? Abstaining. That's a pass. Yeah, that's a pass. That's a pass, 2-1-1. One, one. Okay, that's majority, okay. Except you need three to sign, I think. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'll sign if that's a majority of the board, you know, I'm, as a member of the board that it was your vote, but you know, I, I just, I think that this issue could have been resolved, and I think, you know, I don't. I mean, I would add that the fact that we, I mean, it's unfortunate that this wasn't in our packet for us to review. Um, that really has nothing to do with, I don't think it has, it has to do with council, maybe, but, um, but not insulate. So I don't want the onus to be on insulate for the fact that we didn't get these until, um, be, it's really, really between our council and their council. No, oh, blame the attorneys. Okay, you know. well, that's everybody's <laughs> council, but ne you know, negotiate. I, I, you know, so I'll physically sign it if the majority of the board voted for it. But I'm on the record not supporting this. Okay. So okay. So we're we're done. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Thank you. So we just should we sign these things that we have in front of us? Um, okay. Okay, 8 o'clock, uh, we have NARA Park Master Plan Presentation and Parking Fee Implementation. Oh, yes, we see town staff. And, thank you. Um, Those are all signed. Maybe. Three? Okay. Yeah, there's three. Okay. Are you set for us, Janet? Yes, Mr. Tidman. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, we're excited. We're here tonight just to um, bring the NARA master plan to you that we've been promising for quite some time. Um, it's hard to believe that. Uh, Nara Park is approaching 20 years of, uh, of existence. Um, I, I can clear, clearly remember back in the mid-90s when it was all just a sort of a big conceptual dream, this park we were going to build in North Acton. Um, and in developing a master plan, we, we, thought, we thought of several things. We thought as we did the open space and recreation plan, let's do a master plan that's more of a coffee table-like master plan that's very you know, much full of photographs and things that have happened over the years so that you get a real sense of the history of the park and not just a kind of a dry master plan document that we've done for other things. Um, so that was the, the, the premise for the NARA master plan. Make it somewhat similar to the open space and rec plan and 
take everybody through the history of NARA from you know the mid 1990s till now. Um, and again, it's hard to believe NARA is approaching 20 years years uh, old. Um, and it seems very timely for us to, to tackle the NARA Master Plan now, in that many of the folks that worked on NARA Master Plan or NARA project are now retired. Um, so in developing the Master Plan, we had to search around and find some of these people to interview them and get information for the plan. Um, going back in time, the town of Acton had, had been looking for a, a swimming pond um, through the 1970s and 80s. It searched all over and, and NARA was not, not on the uh, radar at that time. In fact, in the 1970s, the 40-acre gravel, abandoned gravel pit that became NARA Park was slated for Acton's next dump. That would have been the dump. Um, the state stepped in and said, gosh, you guys, you know, you have um, a lot of groundwater wells down gradient of this future dump. There's no way you're going to get your state approvals to uh, put a dump there. So it sat for a long time. And in fact, you can click on uh, one, Kath. Um, it's a little blurry in here, but um, that's uh, the upper left is, is what NARA looked like when we first tackled it, when we were first cutting in. Um, I, I, it's important that I mention that without the relentless attack and pursuit of Bruce Stamsky and other members of the Recreation Commission through the 90, early 90s, Nero, Nero wouldn't have happened. It was just a matter of his pursuit and his just persistence that, that got Nero, Nero to, to go. Um, so, so things started to move forward and, and by the mid-1990s the big dig was had gone from design to, to implementation in Boston and suddenly there was a massive need for gravel in Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, excavating the, the Nero pond and the gravel around the site we, um, we developed, uh, we created about almost 200,000 cubic yards of gravel where that um, truck is being loaded by the loader in the upper picture. That's right where the bathhouse. In fact, these two photographs are taken from exact the same location. Um, so it had come, come quite a ways. You can go to the next one too, Kat. Uh, this is taken from the top of the amphitheater hill, looking down onto the pond. Um, they had a big crushing plant and a rock grinder and a big pump in the pond that, um, that uh, helped to excavate and remove materials. The pond's about nine acres in size, 12 to 14 feet deep, has about 1.5 million gallons of water in it when it's full. Next one, Kat. Um, again, from the top of the amphitheater hill, looking south, looking down at the bathhouse. In the upper picture, that's the, um, the big gravel pile that went into Fort Point Channel in Boston. So that's where all of Acton's gravel went from the, uh, from the NARA project. Last one, I think. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. She'll take you through the sort of the uh, objective, the, uh, the goals and objectives of the master plan, how we put it together, the fact that we did have public survey, and then a big team of people working to, um, to develop the plan. Thanks, Tom. I wanted to start off with a annotated map of NARA. This is something we recently developed. We realized that we need to um, help guide the people who come to NARA as to where things are. I have to say, when I started about 10 years ago working at the park, it was myself and my secretary. Now we have a much larger staff, and we're doing many more things than we did back in 2006. So. We're finding as time goes on, we need to get more sophisticated. So here we go. Here's one of our <laughs> sophisticated devices that we're using. Mr. Plan process has been about two years in the making. Uh, we started off by developing a public survey that we timed to coincide with the um, summer season at NARA. And that's when we're the busiest. That's when we're bringing people in to come to our concerts and events. We are running a summer camp. We, we have a, a very active beach. So over the course of June through September, we were advertising this uh, survey, a constant contact survey that we put out in as many um, venues as possible. In total, we collected 414 responses. And the survey itself, um, 
couple dozen questions, and we also gave the opportunity for people to write in their comments. So as you might imagine, by the end of uh, September, we had quite a bit of material to analyze. Uh, we decided to take on this project by involving our entire natural resources staff. I have a, a staff of four full-time employees in recreation. Tom uh, has two part-time employees who work in conservation. And all together, we worked as a team. We basically sifted through the data um, and analyzed it. And we realized that as staff members, we had a wealth of experience managing this park. So we took on the task pretty doggedly. We set up meetings where we could all get together and walk and talk the park. And we brought our cameras and we brought our uh, recording devices so that we could make sure that we captured all the information that we talked about collectively as we did our walks around NARA. And we kind of systematically went from one zone of the park to the next. So <clears throat> in some total, we had a massive amount of material. And we decided to do this project in-house. We decided that we could devote the time, take our time to compile it and make it make sense from our perspective, incorporating all of the great public input that we got through our survey. So in essence, I think, believe we have a copy of the master plan for each of the board members. Um, this was, uh, we did this publication in-house with our own computer skills. <laughs> uh, we plan to put it out to a uh, printer for a final print but this is our draft copy that you have in your hands. And again, as Tom said, it is a coffee table book. We incorporated many, many photographs to illustrate all of what we talked about. So the outcome of all this analysis was that we narrowed it down to six main goals, and under those goals, there are a number of objectives. And just quickly, from a high level, we're developing a long-range park master plan or management strategy. We want to meet taxpayers' expectations. Customer service is number one. We want to preserve, protect, and enhance our park's natural environment, something that's extremely important to us. It's a people park, but it's also a natural area as well. Construct and maintain facilities to meet user needs. Now this is what you think of first when you think in a master plan. You're talking about facilities. It's a very important component, but it's not the only one. Expand and enhance arts and culture. You may realize that we um, undergo a lot of planning to conduct concerts and special events throughout the year. Arts and culture is extremely important to us and we wanted to make that a very big part of this plan. Lastly, although there's no action plan to implement this, if opportunities arise, from our experience, we know that there may be opportunities if surrounding parcels are available, it would be wise to think about expanding the park if and when it's possible. I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of how this uh, data kind of got drilled down. Those were our broad goals that I just mentioned. This is the detail to which we <laughs> sifted it all down to. After categorizing into these goals, we took all of the numerous action items that we wanted to perform and categorize them under a particular goal. Now, we wrote a big narrative about each of the functional areas within NARA. And what we wanted to do was tie these goals to our descriptive narrative. So what you see in this table is the action item that is listed in each row. Uh, what we think it will cost, where we think we can fund it from, 
And we also have a cross-reference to the narrative in the booklet that precedes it, that gives you more or less the background of why, why do this particular item. Now, all the items in this table are in priority order. So whatever's at the top is what we consider the most important. What's at the bottom is less so. And here's just um, an example of some cross-referencing. Um, that particular item that I had brought up before is about uh, park security. I just highlighted some text within uh, the narrative talking about park security here. And some of the things are pertinent to a topic I'm bringing up uh, to round out this discussion, that being uh, implementing a parking fee for the park. So all of these items I've brought up here pertain to that particular item. So in some in summation, the master plan puts out a 10-year guide to uh, very important actions that we would like to perform over this period of time. Um, and I would say it is a working document. We see us changing and updating as time goes on. Certain opportunities happen, sometimes they don't, and we have to readjust our planning. So this is a working document. And I brought up this particular chart. This is in reference to uh, a proposal that uh, the Recreation Commission has submitted to implement a parking fee at NARA for non-residents. Um, I put together a chart listing how this would work. Parking fees are something that we believe are a new revenue source that we'd like to introduce in order to fund additional hiring for seasonal staff. Over the past several years, we found that the park is in great demand, and we have many people coming, not only from Acton, but from surrounding towns. We found that in order to manage the, properly, we can't just rely on our existing staff. They are program-oriented. Our camp counselors take care of campers. Our beach staff takes care of the beach. What we really need are park staff, people who manage who comes in, who goes out, and keeps an eye on everyone else who's enjoying the park. So what I have here is a table that shows you that um, in addition to the fees that the Recreation Department brings in for selling um, beach passes and for camp fees, we'd like to introduce a new revenue source, parking fees. And this parking fee will help support additional staffing that we require. And I've detailed here that for the coming summer, we would like to be able to afford to pay two additional park rangers and six parking attendants. We propose that for non-residents coming to park at NARA, that they be stopped by a parking attendant, and if they are not non-resident, they will be charged a $5 fee. And in terms of uh, how this fee will offset the costs, I've detailed how many hours we will need uh, to have adequate um, coverage at the park if we have two beautiful days of sunshine <laughs> on a Saturday and a Sunday, and we have a lot of uh, activity going on. What makes sense about this proposal is that the fee is going to support the people who are carrying out the task. If we have a rain out of a day, we're not going to be having our parking attendants out there, likely. So we'll be generating revenue um, when they're working.
just like our uh, beach, when we don't have uh, sunshine and it's cold and windy and rainy, we, we don't open our snack bar. It would be the same situation for this particular uh, group of employees as well. So their hours would be severely limited when we don't need them, in other words. So that summarizes um, everything regarding the master plan, and we'd like to open it up for your questions. Sure, questions from the board? Anybody, Katie? Um, well, thank you, first of all, for putting together this master plan, reading through it this weekend. I mean, it's incredibly comprehensive. The pictures are, you know, beautiful, and, and you guys did a wonderful job with the layout. And um, I was glad you highlighted those tables, Kathy. I thought that was one of the, the best parts um, of the, the document. It was just, it made it very clear kind of what, you know, were the projects you were looking to do, how much, you know, you anticipated it would cost for the ones you thought were potential sources of funding would be the timeline for doing all of those and then I really liked like you said tying it back to um, the, the parts of the earlier part of the document that that um, you know uh, explain or, or um, uh, you know the, re the request so I thought it was very well done um, and I uh, really appreciate all the work you guys have put out into this over the past couple of years and I have to say too I was really impressed um, you know I heard about it some at the Recreation Commission meetings but with the number of responses you got to the survey I think we do a lot of surveys you know in town at different times and it was a good um, a good number of people that that responded which I think speaks highly to how much people like and enjoy and, and use NARA um, we were just there the other night for the town um, volunteer appreciation night and everybody was talking about how beautiful it looked, you know, and we were in the new picnic pavilion and just how wonderful a spot that is. So it uh, it was a, a really nice place to do that and, and uh, you know, it's always just nice to hear people appreciate this kind of gem that we have that, you know, most, most communities don't have especially if our size have something of this caliber so um, thank you first of all for for everything you did to to put this together and I didn't read every single word in it but you know read, read most of them and have to again have to say it was very well done um, and then I just had a couple questions on the on the parking um, so I think it makes sense you know a lot of sense that as you mentioned Kathy the staff would only be there when you anticipate um, being able to get revenue and, and the need for them. Um, do you think you'll have trouble though finding people who are willing to work without kind of a guaranteed number of hours? Or has that not been a problem? I don't believe it's a problem. We've put feelers out there and we have people who want to work weekends. Okay. And we propose that it will be probably weekends only. It's only during peak demand times, right. typically during the week, uh, it's quite manageable. It's on the weekends when people want to have family functions primarily. Right. Um, and then it seemed like the, the numbers were based on, you know, anticipating 400 cars that were non-resident cars. Um, but it, and, and I might have been reading this wrong just in the recommendations that it seemed like on average in a weekend there are maybe 440, 450 or so cars. I didn't know if that was at one time then or because I would, I would expect that many of those would be resident cars. Uh, some of the examples I gave were snapshots at a okay. particular time, time of the day. Okay. Of course there's people coming, people going. There's a lot of turnaround throughout the day. Yeah. And then do you think you'll do I know you said mostly on weekends, but do you think you'll institute the parking fee for some of the larger events or concerts as well for out-of-town residents, or would it just be during these kind of busy beach weekends? It would be during NARA beach operations, okay. which is from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. We don't plan to charge uh, parking fees during our events. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then this has nothing to do with the recreation department. I, I did just reading through this and, and reading through some of the quotes that were pulled out. I have to say I was, and again, this is not reflective of the Recreation Department at all. It was just 
the people that responded to the survey, but I have to say I was bothered by some of the responses. Um, and I want to make it very clear that we are in no way discouraging people from out of town to come to NARA and that we're very welcoming to people not from Acton using NARA. Um, and I think there were a few comments in here that were, um, you know, that, that were a bit disparaging, A, to people of out of town, and B, to people that I think people assumed were from out of town because they didn't look or sound like them. And, and I just wanted to, to point that out and mention my discomfort with it just because it was in our packet. And, um, you know, and, and I, again, it's not reflective of the feelings at all of the recreation department or this town, and I know that very, very much. Um, and so just if there's any of the people who made these comments listening to this tonight, you know, I, I just want to say that um, I'm not supportive of those. Um, and I, that those in no way went into my decision to support this recommendation at all. And, and really it's about the um, need to, to deal with the parking issues there um, and just in terms of managing that. And especially when, although it sounds like not this summer, but especially when the Bruce Freeman comes in, that it, that it will be, um, you know, a, a much, uh, probably a bigger, bigger uh, concern or, or overcrowding issue. So. Um, again, I, you know, I think there are good points people made and that you made and showed through data about the issues around parking. Not great points made about, you know, the kinds of people that use NARA because NARA is open and welcome to everybody and Recreation Department has done a great job of making that clear and encouraging um, all kinds of people to come throughout all of our events um, and the variety of events that you guys hold and, and put together. And again, I just want to thank you for that. Um, you know, try to go to some of the events in the summer concert series and things like that. And there's such a variety and they're so well done. And it's just incredible, uh, you know, who comes here. And it was funny to flip through and see that picture of you with the Jonas Brothers a few years ago, <laughs> Kathy. So <laughs> I know a lot of teenage girls that I'm sure are very jealous of <laughs> that you got to meet them. But again, just overall, thank you so much. A lot, a lot of work went into this and I think it's a, a really well done document. Other members of the board, Peter, Joan. Joan, go ahead. Kathy, well done, as usual. Um, where would these parking facilities be located? Well, our staffing for our parking attendants would be located at the entry of both the lower lot and or upper lot, depending on the volume of traffic we're expecting that day. Uh, we typically set up a uh, portable tent and uh, table chairs uh, so they're sheltered from the sun. <laughs> uh, of course, being out in the sun all day, you have to be careful. Um, so they'd collect the parking fee at either spot? Correct. Thank yes. You. Is that it, John? Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, I have, I have a... Go, well, I, okay, go ahead, Peter. If you've got a question, I'll, I go last, so. Um, I mean, I, you know, being a member of the CPC, I think the C Community Preservation Committee will, will be happy to see this document um, in considering future requests for funding for recreation projects. I mean, I, I got to compliment you also about how spectacular NARA is and the programming out there. Uh, it's a jewel that uh, lots of other towns wish they had, and uh, this will certainly help keep it that way for a long time. I also got to say that it was a nice coincidence that uh, Nathaniel Allen, a veteran from the Civil War who won the Medal of Honor at Gettysburg's name fit into NARA, <laughs> and so it's now Nathaniel Allen Recreation Area rather than North Acton. Um, but uh, I just, can you pull up the slide again of this funding? You, you're not planning to have all six parking attendants on at the same time, are you? Or is it, will you rotate among them? Or They would be rotating. Okay. But if we were maxed, this is the max. Okay. If they were to work both days. And those hours are over the whole summer, or is that? That's a, a week? week. That's a weekly analysis. That's for a week. Okay. So 20 hours for two new park rangers, does that mean they get health insurance from the town for working 20 hours? No, oh. it does not. They are seasonal, seasonal workers. Employees. Okay. Um, 
did you have, did you give any consideration toward uh, assigning parking places for uh, residents like they do at the, uh, at the train station? Or are you worried that, um, you know, residents might not be able to park if, if, because their spaces might not be available that are taken up by non-residents? Has that been a problem? We would adjust our uh, parking methods if necessary. Um, it's more or less an issue of being able to flag the people coming into the park if there's an overcrowding situation. In other words, we need somebody stationed at the entryways so that we can warn people the beach is full. For example, our lifeguard ratios to patrons have to be within certain comfortable limits for our staff. And if they get exceeded because there's too many people, we want to turn people away at the gate rather than have them come all the way in and find that they can't get on the beach. So in those situations, um, we want to prevent people parking on grass, which has happened when we've had overcrowding situations. So we need somebody, uh, I mean, the staffing that we're going to have is going to help uh, alert people before they enter as to what the availability of parking is. Okay. Going forward, when the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail is open, we, we're going to have 11 designated parking spaces for Bruce Freeman users. Yeah. And the parking attendants will be managing that as well. And if for some reason we don't have adequate parking, we can refer them to other designated parking areas for Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. Okay, I just wanted to expand a little bit for a minute um, the discussion into the funding of recreation in general, which I'm learning as I go along. I learned that uh, the uh, that budget Saturday that recreation it doesn't go through the normal budgeting process. It's all under the town manager's purview. It looks like from reading some of this that uh, the state statute is basically a revolving fund that uh, uh, what comes in pays for what the services are, uh, and you're limited to, uh, you try to budget to come in with less than 10,000 surplus um, at the end of the year. Otherwise, anything that's over that goes into the general fund, right? Is that uh, okay? That's correct. Um, and there's been discussions, I know the CPC has been interested in seeing if the Recreation Department could somehow build up a surplus to fund uh, some of the programs that you've asked the CPC to fund because there's there's a feeling among some members on the Community Preservation Committee that uh, the town is over reliant on the Community Preservation Fund to fund recreation capital improvements over other capital improvements in town. I think part of that obviously is because recreation is eligible for Community Preservation funding. Um, but there have been questions about whether uh, you could build up a, some kind of a surplus to, you know, uh, anticipate future um, expenditures for improvements. Um, so if you, if and, and I don't know how you go about setting your fees, whether they might be too high to, you know, not allow everybody to participate. But if you did have fees that built up a, a, a surplus and it went back to the general fund. Is it possible for the town to just say, well, um, you know, recreation turned back this much money into the general fund, um, and we're asking town meeting to appropriate that money back to recreation to fund particular improvements that they need? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in theory, you could do that. I mean, technically, any anything turned back is a general is a general revenue. It's not you know, usually uh, assigned to any particular department, like building permit fees and things like that. I mean, one way to do it, uh, but we'd have to study it very carefully, is to create an enterprise fund, just like just like uh, sewer, just like uh, uh, ambulance, et cetera. Uh, and that way, you can build a fund balance, and that fund balance can be used for capital expenses. So, um, you know, that'd be one thing for the future we could probably look at. Yeah, who knew how complicated enterprise funds were? I mean, <laughs> it turns out so. I mean, we actually, when, when I was town manager in Westford, we created a, a recreation enterprise fund, so it, so it can be done. But I think we'd have to study it very carefully because I think one thing we, we don't want any more of is, is enterprise funds that take general fund subsidies. So we'd have to look at it. 
Okay, I mean, because there has been before us the last few meetings um, site plan permits that, um, you know, we've been asked to waive uh, um, requirements that developers build sidewalks and make a contribution to a fund. It was always the sidewalk fund. Now it's turning out to be recreation. And I have real questions about whether um, the zoning that's appropriate under the zoning bylaw, but in a broader sense, um, Really, this board ought to look at you know those kind of issues um, and uh, make a decision. Um, should we be using um, you know money that we usually use to build sidewalks to fund bicycle and other and bicycle programs through planning department and uh, and recreation programs as well? Um, I know the 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 Main Street 40B uh, didn't come through us; it went through the ZBA, but but designates those monies for sidewalk and recreation improvements in the neighborhood. So clearly that's looking at Jones Field, I assume. I, I don't know who makes the decision. I'm told the selectmen uh, about which, how, what portion of that $60,000 goes to sidewalks, you know, versus recreation. So those are a lot of questions I have at the board level about how recreation gets funded and whether um, that's an appropriate process. And, and I have no problem with funding recreation. I'm all in favor of it. I'm, I'm you know, um, I think we ought to have more recreation in town. But um, whether it goes to sidewalks or bicycles or recreation is a real question. So uh, it just ought to be a policy decision about how we decide that. But anyway, okay. thanks, thanks again for uh, that beautiful space out there. Appreciate it. I don't mean to cut you short, Peter. If you have anything else to say, I will add. We're five minutes late. I have to read two uh, hearing notices. A public hearing of the Acton Board of Selectmen will be held on Monday, May 22, 2017, at 8.30 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room at 204 of the Acton Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton, for National Grid, to install and maintain approximately 64 feet, more or less, of a two-inch gas main in Martin Street, Acton, 32 feet from the existing two-inch gas main at house number 31, and 32 feet from the existing two-inch gas main at house number 45, westerly to the entrance of Seal Harbor subdivision, which is a private way. And a public hearing of the Acton Board of Selectmen will be held on Monday, May 22, 2017, at 8.35 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room, 204 of the Acton Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton for National Grid to install and maintain approximately 20 feet, more or less, of a two-inch gas main in Main Street, Acton, from the existing eight-inch main at house number 279, northerly to the property line of a private way for the purpose of providing gas service to three future homes. We will get back to those in a minute. Um, any other comments from other board members before I ask my stupid questions? <laughs> okay. Um, I have a... I had a question about, like, how do you distinguish between who's resident and who's, who's non-resident? Um, you, are you going to have an ID system? You're going to have passes for residents or stickers? Uh, or is it, yeah, I, I don't know if you do that already. And if you do keep counts, if you have an approximate count of the proportion of people who use NARA who are, who park there who are residents as opposed to non Janet, this would be a, a new enterprise for us. Um, to start with, because we're, we're going into the uh, Memorial Day weekend this Saturday, um, we're going to depend upon people showing a license, a driver's license, and go by that. Uh, what we'd like to do is implement a sticker program in which uh, residents can receive a sticker that they put on their vehicle, and we can simply wave them in. Okay, and is there, is there any plan at some point if you find that um, a lot of the spaces are taken up? I, I don't know, if you find that non-residents are taking up a lot of the spaces and, and residents get shut out, are you planning at some point to, to reserve some spaces for residents? Yes, we may. Um, one of our concerns is about having adequate spaces for people who are coming in for picnic rentals. Mm -hmm. We can anticipate roughly how many people are coming for any given event. So one of the things we want to be able to manage better is making sure that we maintain space for those rentals. 
Okay, and I would echo what everybody has said about this. I have not, I've been looking at it while I've been sitting here and has, it reminds me of the open space plan, which was really, a, you know, an opus um, by the Natural Resources Department and the Open Space Committee and a whole host of people uh, with lots of pictures and charts and, and very interesting reading in both the draft and final form. And I'm looking forward to going through this more carefully, but I am, I was really, I, impressed by the slide, the slides showing the before and after. I mean, what was there before, which I had heard was very unattractive, as you would expect a sort of a sand and gravel pit uh, to be, and, and what has the transformation has brought us today. So, um, but thank you both for all of your efforts. And now I will quickly open it up to audience comments, because I saw Kim up here waiting patiently. Hi, I'm Kim Castens, 294 Pope Road. And um, I really appreciate the effort that you put into making Nara Pond area so park area so beautiful for us, and the master plan looks lovely. Um, my question is, um, you've given a lot of thought to handling cars. Um, what thought does the master plan say about making it possible to arrive there through other means than coming in a car, either uh, fostering and making it easier to come by walking, bicycle, or public transportation? I have a diagram of the park. Hello. You'll notice the blue lines, mm -hmm. or teal lines. That is the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. It merges with the pond walking path, and you'll see that there is a spur that goes into the lower parking lot. So we're preparing to put in bicycle racks to support the increased bicycle traffic that will be coming to NARA because uh, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail makes it a stopover. So it's going to be easy for um, people who are taking that trip to stop in at NARA. Okay. And we anticipate also that many people will want to bring their bicycles in their vehicles and park there as a stopping point. Thus we feel uh, from Chelmsford's experience, Chelmsford has measured 1,000 visits or uh, trips a day coming through Chelmsford um, when they've measured it on an annual basis. It's going to be quite that, a bit. You know, have you given any thought to converting some of those car arrivers into bicycle arrivers? So, well, we're going to encourage it certainly. Sorry, go ahead, Tara. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Uh, I just want to talk about a couple of things. Um, first of all, the idea of an enterprise fund. I worry about, um, as much as I respect all the work and appreciate the work that you do for the community, I worry about the Recreation Department becoming a business. Um, and so I just want to say that I have that worry. Um, also, I, I caution that if we use our position to, for personal gain, um, in particular, the celebrity elbow rubbing, which I heard mention of earlier. Um, I'm very much opposed to that. Um, but I've stood up mostly to talk about the access to the parking spaces, because I know a lot of people that come from out of town. And here in Acton, we, we come from a place of privilege. And so I hope that um, there's going to be a way that people that may not be able to afford um, to pay can get in to use the public facility for free. And I don't know how you do that, um, except for to wave people on that look like they're having a hard time. But I know a lot of people that do come and use the Nara Park that are having a real hard time, and I hate to see them turned away. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? All right, now what, what, do you need some sort of formal approval from us of the parking fees, or is that all under your auspices? Yes, we were looking for your approval of the parking fee. 
I'll make proposal. A, I'll make a motion to approve the recommendation from the recreation director to the board of selectmen for implementing a NARA parking sticker program per her memo. Second There's, the motion. Okay, Katie moves and uh, Joan seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. There you have it. And thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. And we're letting you get out early, <laughs> comparatively, so. Um, now, National Grid, is there somebody here? Yes. Hi. Hi. You're up. Okay, thank you. Sorry, we're a Which little bit are, late. That's all right. Yeah. Which one are we doing for us? Uh, Martin Street. Uh, the National Grid hereby respectfully requests your consent to the location uh, to install and maintain approximately 64 feet, more or less, of two-inch gas main in Martin Street in Acton, 32 feet from the existing two-inch gas main at house number 31, and 32 feet from the existing two-inch gas main at house number 45, westerly to the entrance of Seal Harbor subdivision, which is a private way for the purpose of providing gas service to 32 future homes, units. <coughs> All right, questions, comments from the board? Katie? <laughs> <laughs> so you probably don't, and, and I'm sorry, what's your name again? Barbara. Barbara, Barbara, you yeah. probably don't know this. We've received a lot of um, comments and questions from members of the public um, with concerns, there are general concerns that we, this board's expressed before and is continuing to look into and work on related to um, discouraging new natural gas hookups. Um, both of these applications unfortunately are for new developments and mm -hmm. I think are the prime yes, yeah, yeah. opportunities where we would like to, um, again, no offense uh, no. To, to National Grid, but like to discourage um, the use of natural gas. And so it's disappointing to see both of these come in. Um, and then the other is around the gas leak. So I have a question about if um, there's a standard procedure that when you're opening road um, to do these installations, if at the time you repair gas leaks in the area where you, if at least you've opened the road. I'm pretty sure that if the, if it was in the vicinity that they opened up the road, yes, they would they would indeed um, fix the, the a gas leak. And they would have to be, I mean, identified ones that are identified by National Grid, or are they things that you know the town the town said we believe there are natural there are gas leaks, you know, in this area that National Grid would be willing to, um, you know, uh, investigate and repair. I, honest to goodness, yeah. I'm, I'm a small fish in a big pond. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> I know, and I, you know, and, I'm sorry yeah, that it's you, Barbara, yeah. that gets our questions. And I would certainly, I'll uh, entertain, I'll give you my card, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. put you in touch with someone who can answer those questions for you, like, you know, affirmatively, with a firm commitment to doing that. Okay, um, and again, you know, I mean, we've had requests to um, either deny these or to put conditions on them that, you know, require National Grid to repair the gas leaks. Um, and Jada, I don't know if you want to talk about the quick, you know, um, decision or, or advice you um, were given from council. Well, before any, we could go further, and we will continue to discuss this and invite comments from the audience, but. Um, yeah, we have gotten, there is a fair amount of concern. This is not the first time no, um, no, that been. it's, we've had a number of hearings with the proposed uh, connections, new connections to gas service. And I know that there's an effort afoot involving our building department uh, to sort of ex sort of explore alternative uh, sources of power and whatnot, just so that when you talk to developers, they, they see a viable alternative. But that still is being worked on. In the meantime, we're having these gas hookup requests. Um, I was concerned uh, about, you know, I didn't know if we could condition mm -hmm. our decision or if we could only deny um, a permission or, or, or what our options were. And basically, we heard from town council that frankly, what some commu many communities or a number of communities are doing is they're going the general local bylaw route, whereby you can um, basically require that um, a gas service or whatever utility um, do repairs um, of ex leaks and whatnot. 
uh, as a condition of, of approving a gas hookup. Um, I know that there's efforts afoot at the state level to try to get sort of this gas leak problem addressed um, and that um, I guess solutions seem to be elusive or improvements seem to be elusive and that in the meantime there are people who often smell gas and they're concerned about it um, and, and it's, well, it's wasteful, it's bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of reasons, uh, just even practically speaking, you think, well, why wouldn't you want to sort of fix them because all that stuff is going out. Mm -hmm. I know it's expensive to try to track them out and open up the road and nobody likes having roads opened up or whatever or, or lots opened up, but um, you know, the alternative is we sort of just limp along in this current state. So that is, I mean, that is something that I think my colleagues and I will talk about is the possibility of uh, working on a bylaw um, to address this issue. But it's my understanding that, frankly, um, we really, it's dicey uh, from a legal perspective for us to impose conditions. Uh, there was also a suge suggestion from one of the residents that our engineering department take over kind of identifying leak leak locations and providing us with the information so that we'd have it uh, in connection with these hearings. Um, our engineering department has informed well, at least me and the town manager, that they don't have they don't have the equipment. I mean, that would require um, new equipment. It would also probably require some more personnel in order to provide the staffing. So um, that is for the information of you and also for the people in the audience. So um, anyhow, Katie. Okay, Peter, you have something? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're saying if you want, if they, you know, uncovered a gas leak, they repair it, that's your so. understanding. Okay. That's but my understanding. I'm looking at the sch schematic sketch here. Um, you have that in front of you? It's uh, a, it has, a, it's very little opening, correct? Right, your yeah, opening. I mean, you've got, you, you basically, you're not digging up the whole street. You dig no, up right. where you that's need right. to put a new connection in, that's which right. is probably two feet wide or something, and right. then yeah. lay the new pipe in a trench into this new development. Mm -hmm. Right, so, okay. Yes. Uh, so I, it, the only other thing I would say is, um, as far as the engineering department is concerned, I didn't necessarily read the recommendation um, as requiring all that equipment. Maybe that's what what uh, uh, Green Acton meant, but um, they provided us with the information that's already recorded by the state or by the gas company itself. It seems to me that, that the engineering department could provide us in our memos what's already been recorded by other agencies. So we just have an idea in the neighborhood how many gas leaks there might be around these, you know, extensions that they're putting in. So that'd be my suggestion. Well, yeah, I agree that if the information, if they're talking about already existing information, but I'm not sure, you know, if somebody on an ongoing basis monitor actually goes around with these vehicles measuring um, and, and, you know, or if that's something that needs to be updated by a, somebody with, with a yeah. deep pocket well, and I'm time, sure. you know, and staffing. So, I'm and sure that, there are new you know. gas leaks, but Acton participated in a program um, that uh, may have been MAPC, but some, some state body um, came to Acton and went all over, not all over town, yeah, but certain was, areas of town and, and recorded all the gas leaks. So. Yeah, uh, but, but it means that there needs to be a concerted effort to get, you know, that coordinate that effort, um, and, and I don't think that, yeah, insofar as doing it town by town, I don't think that's a practical solution. So anyhow, um, are there any comments, questions from the board? Are there? No? Okay. And I don't have any other than what I just said. So um, first of all, I've got to open, uh, read a couple of notices, and then we will get back to the national grid matter. Um, notice is hereby given under Chapter 138, Section 12 of the General Laws that the Board of Selectmen will hold a hearing in the Francis Faulkner Room 204 in the Acton Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton on May 22, 2017 at 8.45 p.m. on the application of New England Hospitality Group, LLC, doing business as Via Mexicana for an all-alcoholic beverage license located at 103 Nagog Park, Acton, Mass. The application is on file in the Suckman's office and may be viewed during normal working hours. And 
The ACTA and Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing notice on May 22, 2017 at 8.50 p.m. in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room 204 at the Town Hall 472 Main Street, Acton, on the application of New England Hospitality LLC doing business as via Mexicana uh, 103 Nagog Park, Acton, Mass. Under Section 140 of the Massachusetts General Laws for a common victualler license, the applications can be inspected at Town Hall during normal business hours. Now, back to National Grid and uh, comments from the audience. Um, Jim Snyder Grant, uh, Half Moon Hill. Um, I wanted to thank Katie and Janet and Peter for, um, you know, n noting the letters that came from uh, citizens, including myself, um, and reflecting those concerns uh, quite accurately, I thought. Um, the, we, we keep showing up when there's uh, gas line connections coming for the reasons that you've stated, that locking in fossil fuel use, fuel use for the next 30 years or so, which is what happens when you get a gas, gas connection to new development, is exactly walking backwards from where we need to be moving. And I know that you selectmen individually and the town as a whole want to be moving forwards rather than backwards. Um, it was very heartening to hear about the, um, your, your, the quick action to contact town council and get a response from the engineering department. Um, a, a bylaw um, is definitely something that should be explored. Um, uh, mothers out front who are here uh, were, were um, instrumental in uh, bylaws in Boston and other, and other communities. So uh, I think there is, there's the will here to, um, to help make that happen. Um, uh, you've seen the letter I wrote, so I just wanted to add tiny little pieces of information to it. Um, the, uh, the study that you alluded to, Peter, with the specific numbers in it, that was an MAPC study um, that the town you know, signed up for along with a number of Massachusetts towns. To understand the purpose of that study, in addition to measuring gas leaks, was to uh, work with um, uh, the highway departments, in our case engineering, um, to, to understand how de town departments and utilities can best work together to get these things fixed. Um, so, um, you know, as you, as you said, opening up roads is expensive and inconvenient. At the same time, most of our roads do get opened up at one time or another over the course of a decade. So it's um, the careful coordination between the town and the utilities is vital. Um, having, having, having citizens concerned uh, th to make this happen quickly is a factor in helping in that coordination, and we're happy to help, uh, you know, to continue to be, uh, to raise these issues, to raise the urgency of having uh, cooperation between the town and the utilities. Um, the particular study that you talked about, Peter, was uh, 15 miles, in the case of Acton, uh, a little sniffer truck. Uh, they would drive around slowly and detect leaks. When they find them, they would stop and measure the concentration of gas uh, in the soil and get a measurement of how large it was in square feet. Um, the, the, the key thing there in that area is that, as you may have noted, um, some of the leaks were relatively small, you know, 20 square feet, 50 square feet, but there are huge leaks. Um, 1,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet. And even more urgently, there are leaks that have really high percentage of gas in the air below the ground, um, greater than 50%, in one case 90%. Um, this, is, this is what takes us into the territory of what's called the super emitters, the, the gas leaks that are a relatively small percentage of the leaks in every town, but account for a very large proportion of the leaks. And as, as we've reviewed before, it's the, it's the leaks during the production and transmission of natural gas that are the, the main climate issue with natural gas. It burns relatively cleanly, but it's all the methane leaking in the air along the way that causes the extreme effects uh, to, to the climate. It's so uh, translucent to infrared that it traps heat really effectively when it gets into the air. Um, so. I don't know if this particular application is going to result in a particular change. Uh, I, I see, I, I've heard Janet's skepticism after talking to town council about conditioning a particular fix here, and the particular opening is going to be very narrow. Um, but it's just, um, 
but we still have to show up and talk about it because it's just, it's just painful to know that there are 2,000 square foot leaks at you know, 10 Martin Street, for example, just a few yards away from where this pipe is going in. Um, I want us to keep working together and figuring out how we can get those things fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Symes, Concord Road. I'm ducking up here for a really quick one just to say it is painful. I mean, I could practically weep <laughs> every time one of these things comes up because I just feel, as Jim said, like we're going in the opposite direction. And um, the power of methane, natural gas is 95% methane, uh, to add to the warming, the warming planet is, I don't know if you guys are planning to say this, but it's 80 to 86 times, it has 80 to 86 times over the first 20 year period the greenhouse gas warming impacts of CO2. So it's a super, super, super duper greenhouse gas. Also, zero aspersions cast, but Barbara, I wonder, you're like the third person from Natural Grid I've heard say, I'm just a little fish. I would like you to pass the message that we need, I would love, I would we, need we need bigger fish here. Ten. I know it, I know. Look okay. <laughs> That's my invitation. Thank you. Thank you, yes, I will. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, Judith Ehrenstein, Acton, uh, Gregory Lane. I'm here representing Mothers Out Front, and it's an organization that started in Massachusetts, but it's now world, uh, nationwide. And their mission is basically, as a grassroots mission, to bring together people to see that climate change is not going away and that we want our leaders to start changing legislation. Um, what Jim has said in particular about methane and what Deborah said and the numbers, I'm not a numbers person, I'm a mom, I've got three kids, I've got a future that I'm thinking about for my children and I'm, you know, I have maps here of Acton and unrepaired, unrepaired leaks and there's over 150 of them and the big concern in my mind are these super emitters. Um, if anyone's taken a walk, National Grid, not, you're doing a great job. There's white lines everywhere. We've met with Corey and three people from National Grid. The uh, well, the yellow lines are the existing and the white lines are the ones that are working towards repair. Is that correct? Um, no, I think yeah. The yellow is the gas, but apparently when they put white down, it means that's where they're gonna be doing the work. There's a lot of lines. There's also a lot of smell. So anyways, uh, I feel like our job as Mothers Out Front, we're gonna be raising awareness. We're not going away. We're planning a, what's called a uh, gas leak tagging event in the fall. And that will be hopefully either tagging at least the super emitters, as many as we know that are on that 15 mile piece that's been tracked, but we may go for all 158 of them. And it'll be a big event. And I think more people are gonna be paying attention and are gonna be upset. We're not gonna wanna upset them like, oh my God, the gas is leaking, we're all gonna blow up. But, you know, to understand that this is real and um, we need to make a change. And the other thing I didn't say is that Mothers Out Front sort of deals on two fronts. One is uh, switching people over to more sustainable energy and the other is gas leaks in particular. So that statewide they've decided that that's where they want to focus on climate change issues. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Is she going to submit the map? Just let him pass yeah. around. Well, it maybe really if you have it, if you want to send, if you'd submit an electronic version, if it's available. So if you go to squeakylakes.com, Squeaky, I think I've been there. and that is a, I believe it's a compilation with MAPC and HEAT, H-E-E-T, and you look up Acton, or you can look up any city you're interested in, and you will get a very comprehensive map of all the leaks. Great. Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like to remind Bar Barbara, you would offer to provide a card for somebody who's, who's yes. higher up we could call. So would you, would you just give it to Lisa um, before you leave? You don't have to do it now, but just don't forget to do that because it would be nice to have a contact person who will, will provide you know, verifiable reassurances that the leaks are going to get fixed. So thank you. Yes. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. It's my understanding that the answer from council, and this is coming from somebody who was a selectman at one time, that the answer from council largely depends on how 
you ask it. So if you ask, can we deny it, you get one answer. If you ask, how can we deny it, you get another answer. Um, so I would urge you to ask, how can we deny? Because I don't think that we're ever going to get the big fish to come unless we deny it. And so um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, what are the steps to get a bylaw that is similar to the Boston bylaw in place here in Acton? Uh, that remains to be seen. I think that there's probably, I certainly am interested in that. I thought it was very heartened to, to learn that that was what people were doing, that there was something other than sort of uh, serially dealing with these things and having absolutely no leverage. But, um, you know, that remains to be seen. I mean, people are going to have to start working on it. We haven't even had a chance to talk about it. So um, so people who are interested can set up a meeting with you then? Or? Well, I think, you know, it may be that, you know, because there are a number of models out there, um, it would be a matter of either, either citizens can work on it or, you know, we could get council to develop a good model. Um, you know, it doesn't look as if it would be a difficult task because there are so many templates to, to look at, but um, we haven't even had a chance to talk about that. Katie, you have a comment? Yeah, I would say the other way, and, and I think probably just generally getting the sense of the members on this board is that we're having our goal setting meeting in a few weeks. And so if the selectmen generally make something like this a goal um, and, and vote it as a priority, then it's something that, you know, town staff and the selectmen prioritize. So I think that that's, you know, certainly obviously something we're hearing and, and can talk about. And, you know, I think more than one of us would be willing to put forward as a goal. Um, and that, you know, we we're planning for a town meeting and, December for um, related to school issues, but also, um, you know, usually tech other things on as well. And that I think um, it, it would be, uh, you know, a, a worthwhile endeavor if we make it a goal that then we can get staff and um, citizens and the selectmen to work on putting together a bylaw um, to bring to town meeting. And, and Tara, I think that is the how, um, at least that we're feeling like right now. So is to put this bylaw in place and feel like we have some some leverage or, so, or protection or support to then um, deny or condition these permits. So I think we've at least got a way forward on, on part of the issue and are continuing again to work with Deborah and Jim and Green Act and others on um, dealing with policy and procedure changes related to encouraging the use of alternatives in these developments so that these petitions don't come before us in the first place. Thank you. Um, and so my last question is about how to, um, in the state law that was passed last year, um, while I think that it was quite weak, um, there was a provision in there that if the street is opened, that the leaks have to be repaired. Um, the trick is, is to keep track of when they're opening the street and ensure that they are in fact fixing the leaks because otherwise they can just ignore it and we would never know. So um, I like the idea of engineering being on top of when the street openings are um, and mapping that against the leaks, which we already know, um, and ensuring that they do because if they don't, there's a fine that we can collect um, through the state or at least ensure that they get um, that the state gets it from them so that uh, at least we have that uh, fallback. Thank you. Thank you. Judith Ehrenstein again. Um, two things. One is that Corey, uh, town engineer Corey York, does meet with National Grid twice a year to coordinate their openings. And the other is that it's squeakyleaks.org, not com. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> I think we would have figured it out eventually, you know, but anyhow. Um, all right, any other comments from the audience? Um, somebody, discussion, motion, whatever? Well, noting the continued disappointment and our hope that the um, leaks in this area will at least be fixed while this portion of the road is open, um, I will, with those things noted, make a motion to approve the petition. Um, for a uh, gas main installation at Martin Street. At, I'll have the correct one in front of me right now. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Katie moves and Peter second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstaining? Okay. You have, you have one more, right? Or I do. do. Yeah. OK, 
Okay. Um, yeah. The National Grid hereby respectfully requests your consent to install and maintain approximately 20 feet, more or less, of two-inch gas main in Main Street in Acton from the existing eight-inch gas main at House 279 northerly to the property line at, uh, of a private way for the purpose of providing gas service to three future homes. Questions, comments from the board? No. Motion? Noting the same concerns I made in the previous motion, I will make a motion to approve the gas um, installation as noted in the petition. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Snyder Grant, did you have comments? Um, yeah, just one. Um, sure. So for the previous petition, I, I noted the, uh, the MAPC uh, report by going on the 15 miles of Acton Road. I just want to make sure that the selectmen and the public were aware of another important source of information about leaks, which is that state law now requires that the utilities report uh, leaks that are s still unfixed uh, and leaks that were fixed uh, on an mm -hmm. annual basis. Um, so using that report, um, the, uh, the nearby leaks on Main Street are at 254, 274, and 282 Main Street. Those are all very close to Kelly's Corner. Um, as we've noted before, that's not exactly where the very small opening will be, but it's just another indication of um, nearby leaks um, that would be the sort of leaks that would be awesome to get fixed at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Miriam Lezak, High Street. I just have a, I, I was listening, you know, carefully, and, and part of this, this is to, to install and maintain um, the gas pipe, the, this, this new gas pipe. And it seems like they're not doing a very good job on um, maintaining the existing pipes. And I'm not sure what we can, I mean, you know, this is what this whole thing is about. But um, that seems to be a problem. And if they're not maintaining what they already have, should we be letting them put in more? I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Um, so part of the state law is that if the street is open for any reason, um, cable, uh, water main, whatever it is, that the gas company, if notified by the town, has to respond within a certain time. So that's also an action on our part that we've got to keep track of everything and coordinate the street opening mm -hmm. permits with the gas leak situation. And thank you, Joan, for voting no. Even if it's just symbolic, it's important to uh, let them know that this stuff is coming and that people aren't going to put up with it forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? And I don't know, Barbara, if you have any response to the comment that National Grid is not doing a very good job of maintaining what it installs. Well, I, the, the, the stuff that's going in is plastic. It's a lot different from the, the, the old stuff. That's, I'm not a, I know, I keep saying that, but. <laughs> You're small fish. <laughs> All right, we simplify. Uh, or a professional on the, um, the integrity of, the, of what's under the ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Did you moved, right? Yeah, we have a motion and a second. And was there a second? Did Peter you se seconded. Peter seconded. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstaining? Thank you. Okay. And thank, thank you. all of you. Uh, I think you will be hearing um, in the not too distant future about this whole bylaw idea, so. All right, um, now we have uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, late, 8.45, uh, New England Hospitality Group and uh, Via Mexicana, good. And uh, make sure the, uh, push the button on the base there, it's red, yeah, just so that the, the thing, will, and I hope that mic is working well, it wasn't. So just please introduce yourselves and provide whatever information you want to about what you're applying for. Uh, my name is Carol Quinones, I'll be the general manager in Villa Mexicana. Uh, we are going to be opening at 103 Negog Park, 
uh, hopefully all of you are invited to come on opening day. Um, we are applying for a all liquor license. We are focusing mostly on family, you know, fine dining. We are not focusing on um, the alcohol uh, as a major, but as a part of the dining experience. Yeah, maybe you could just clarify where exactly in Nagog Park you're located. Is it when you're when you're standing on on Great Road? Right. Is it over in the right? Or? We're actually right across the gym. So we're on the uh, right-hand side. Oh. Oh, where the old yeah. big stop was. Okay. 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 I, I'll just comment that I, um, well, and I can ask a question about when you're anticipating to open. We are uh, relying on the opening day between 30 to 60 days. We don't have a definite opening day just yet. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, no, I have to say, um, I know you included your uh, proposed venue in with the... Um, application that sounded very good so I was very excited about when you will be opening so keep us informed um, but no I thought it, I thought it was a good application and um, we're excited to have you so thank you and, and welcome to town and with that I will make a motion can I just do one motion are you comfortable with that yeah, or you want to? I'll make a motion to approve the al alcoholic beverage license and the common victual license for a New England hospitality group second any further discussion all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And this menu does look delicious. Yeah, it does. <laughs> You're all invited. You're all invited. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it all. Look at Have this stuff. Oh my gosh. Um, all right, so uh, now we're on back to Selectman's business. We already did insulate and we have two items we have the rack revised charge and then we have town manor manager review um, why don't I take the town manager review first just because I think that's going to be quick we did have an executive session as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting to talk about uh, the town managers contract there are a couple of items that we need to kind of pin down and then we'll probably uh, vote um, at our next meeting at the beginning of June on the final contract, but I'm gonna turn it over to the town manager because he has a few words to say. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in about a week, I'm gonna be um, hitting my 40th year in local government management. And uh, after giving it a lot of thought, I. Um, I'm going to um, announce my retirement um, effective July 1, 2018, so in about a year. Go through one more budget cycle, which is probably against my better judgment, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a long time, 40 years, um, since I'm a Grateful Dead fan, I'm inclined to say what a long, strange trip it's been. Um, but, uh, you know, I've enjoyed uh, working with all the different people and all the different towns I've been in, and it's, it's been a great experience. And, you know, I remember when I was in, um, an undergrad, and uh, I really thought I was going to go to law school, and um, my, uh, my advisor in political science said, have you ever thought about public administration? And I said, no. But he had uh, had a work-study kind of uh, class, and I, I had done some work in the uh, South Bend uh, Department of Public Safety, so he saw something in me that, uh, you know, I obviously didn't think about myself, so in a lot of ways, Professor John Roos of Notre Dame is uh, really responsible for my career, so, um, you know, it's made all the difference, and I really couldn't think of anything else I would rather have done, so I'm still got me around for about a year, but uh, I just thought it'd be, uh, you know, my wife and I have been talking a lot, and you know, it's time to kind of move on to another phase. And uh, also wanted because I know, it, you know, I've been through the other side in, in, in applying for jobs and going through recruitment, and it takes, 
you know, conservatively probably nine months to, to, to hire a new manager. So, you know, I wanted to be fair to the town. The town's been really good to me, and so I, I wanted to give it a, a, a year notice. Well, thank you, Mr. Manager, and we will have you to kick around for another year. So um, well, I won't say my fond farewells just yet, but um, yes, and of course, immediately, um, as soon as I learned that you were going to be re retiring, I thought, oh, great, you know, we have to set up a search committee. Um, and, and why did I decide to become chairman this year? So um, in any event, but uh, no, it's, it's been a, certainly I can speak for myself and probably my board members that it's, it's been a pleasure. And uh, as I said, you're not leaving just yet. So, uh, with that, I, uh, there will be time for discussion further, but um, now on to the, what is actually uh, the last but not least item, which is the RAC revised charge. Um, I have, I guess, some comments. You've all received a set of slides uh, with uh, the RAC, uh, RAC members, or at least a couple of them, their recommendations. I have. Uh, RAC, the whole membership issue has been sort of bothering me because I know that unfortunately we lost two very good members and so it's down to two residents and then Matt Mosseler who has basically been sitting in on meetings as formerly as a resident and now sort of as an Akron Water District uh, representative but um, technically I don't I think he he was more a liaison than a member so whatever I'm not sure that the the slides are really technically uh, rack slides but we'll call them the rack slides um, as you know from the draft that I, I circulated um, and what the rack slides propose there's a significant gap in responsibilities I actually have already started to revise them based on some feedback from town staff members um, and, and in particular, I'd like to include um, some representation from other town committees um, or entities like, such as the Water District. Um, of course, doing, saying that, I realize that we have enough trouble sometimes recruiting people uh, to be on town committees, one town committee set, and, and a lot of times people are reluctant to be on another committee as a representative. Um, but first of all, I guess a little bit of background. I've been the liaison to RAC since basically I joined the board in 2010, um, and I spent a fair amount of time observing not only that committee but other town committees, and then before that I was on conservation. Um, the input from RAC really was sort of initiated by me last year or maybe the year before um, after the stormwater drafting project was done. Um, and the feedback that the committee provided last year was really comparable in breadth to what the recent slides have sort of proposed. Um, and I think that some people have asked why was there a delay in reviving RAC. Um, frankly, I think that a lot of it had to do with um, the, the timing of the Nagog Pond treatment plan proposal. It came in um, at a time when I was still sort of mulling over um, how to overhaul the charge. And it quickly, the proposal from about Nagog Pond quickly became pretty controversial and there were a lot of opinions. And there were, including, there were opinions from individual RAC members and also some of the group who are now sort of helping to propose revisions to the charge. And I really thought it would be precisely the wrong time, although some people would disagree that it would have been the right time, but I thought it would be the wrong time to sort of revive a committee um, that might include members who would want to take, you know, sort of an advocate's stance and maybe advocate for positions that would put the board in an awkward position because we're the ones who have, have really created and authorized the committee and could easily disband it um, because it's an advisory committee and it's subject to our authority. Anyhow, that was the reason, um, and, and as things progressed and the controversy got worse, um, I was even less inclined to um, authorize the committee and I figured that if people had strong opinions about the project it would be better for them to weigh in as citizens. Um, on the narrow, proposed narrow purpose, um, it's been my observation, especially with regard to committees that don't have um, staff support, that the ones that work really well have a pretty narrow focus. It doesn't mean that they don't have a lot to do. It's just that what they're supposed to be doing is pretty focused and um, they, it makes it easier for the committee members to do whatever the work is involved. Um, a lot of times also there are committee members who actually work professionally in some of the things that they're doing on the committee. Um, but 
often the broader the scope of responsibilities, and especially the more the responsibilities are legally mandated, um, then the more essential town staff is or, and or consultants. Um, and to just to get really big uh, scope things done. Um, but, and I anticipate that right now in the near term, when you're talking about really large scale water related tasks, including like the study, um, there's gonna be a lot of reliance on, on not just town staff, but probably we're gonna have to get a consultant, um, the people who are uh, professionally doing this kind of work. Um, the second thought I had was that RAC, is, notwithstanding the, the broad sort of language on the town website that RAC historically has had pretty specific uh, tasks initially, or at least the earliest that one that I'm aware of but was this implementation of something called the CWRMP, which is the Comprehensive Water Resources Management Plan. Um, and it was, at that time, RAC was supposed to provide guidance to the Board of Selectmen on recommendations in the study on long-term water quality. And the study, among other things, identified areas in town where the quality of water was at risk, um, including due to um, wastewater management or lack thereof. And so it sort of became code, I think, in some people's minds for a way to justify sewering, which was not necessarily popular among many people. The more recent assignment, which uh, just was concluded, um, it was uh, that the prior board assigned RAC the task of drafting a couple of stormwater bylaws, which were uh, required under the Federal Clean Water Act. And um, one of the questions I had was, well, should, and I think the committee members also had, was should they go back to this, this water uh, resources study and try to implement uh, or at least uh, an analyze those recommendations. Uh, and I think some of the concern is that the study is pretty old, even though it was supposed to be good for 20 years. Uh, but it's something that is out there, potentially, um, to, to pick up again. But even if you have a narrowly defined role, um, if you have a role that involves a lot of technical issues, um, Sometimes the, the work can be very slow. Um, the stormwater bylaw drafting was really um, very tedious. I can vouch for that. Um, and frankly, if, in retrospect, if I had been on the prior board, the one that, that assigned this to RAC, I probably would have said, get a consultant to do it um, so that the committee members can do something else. Uh, you know, drafting bylaws or any law or legislation is, it's an art, it's a science, it's, you know, it. it it's really better done by people who do it all the time because otherwise, you know, you know, if you, if you're even if you're a good writer, well, if you're a good writer, it can drive you crazy because the writing in a lot of legislation is just god awful. But, um, but if you're a good writer, you want to make everything flow nicely. It, it can be an arduous task. But because I was new to the board when I became liaison to RAC, I just went along with what had been done by my predecessors. And about halfway, about three years in. Um, when the committee was really had, had developed a, a really cumbersome draft that the Conservation Commission had basically panned, um, I, I went to the town manager um, and asked if there was any way, there was any money for a consultant to kind of um, sort of accelerate the process. Um, and fortunately, we were able to get a consultant who then came in with a brand new uh, concise template that actually had been used by other Massachusetts towns. And the actinized version of that is what now uh, the council reviewed, town council reviewed, and then various town committees weighed in on, and the special town meeting approved in the fall of 2015. So what do, why did I focus on public outreach and education? Um, that was a, supposed to be a substantial part of Iraq's original role. Uh, the website says a, very, a major component of the committee's duties will be public outreach and education regarding the various water management programs as they relate to the long-term protection of Acton's water resources. Um, and the need, frankly, for publication about uh, public education about water has continued over the years, especially uh, in the wake of the death of, the, of Mary Michaelman, who really had a lot of, those of you who will know, had fervor about water quality, but she also had science background and her communication skills were really great and she was able to engage non-experts like me and make very uh, technical concepts very comprehensible and, and without being condescending about you know how stupid some of us were about water issues. So my approach with the 
and, and I said, the, I think the mission will change a little bit. I think I, there's stuff I want to add to that, but um, I tried to elaborate it in, in sort of talking about specific um, responsibilities. But um, it's to start with smaller steps, smaller scale, and then expand. Um, the Board of Selectmen has the discretion to expand RAC's role as the committee, you know, committee's value becomes what more widely recognized and they become better established as a source for um, the town, for other permitting boards. Um, um, my only other relevant experience is with the Design Review Board, which had a, was essentially a pilot program to introduce the idea of design review to developments, and it was a little bit controversial in initially, had a very ro rocky start, and over time, with personnel changes, um, and now they have a wonderful chairman, um, Holly Ben Joseph, who's, who's just very organized and, and really very professional, um, they have now gotten to the point where they have a very good reputation um, in the town, and the, we, we broadened the scope of their responsibilities to include not just advising uh, the Board of Selectmen, but all of the permitting boards, and, and just to provide advice to people who want guidance from them. It's free. Uh, they're all professionals. They're architects, uh, landscape architects. There's an engineer. Um, and so it's they've really demonstrated that they provide value to the town. So that is what was sort of behind my, uh, and, and I, because I haven't, I've been the one who hasn't been talking at all about where I see things going. That sort of explains why the draft is the way it is. It is subject to change. I did assure uh, RAC representatives that I, because, well, I see one is in the audience today, but um, you're not supposed to be here, Barry. Uh, but um, the ch current chairman um, is traveling for business, and so I assured um, them that they would have a, an opportunity to weigh in, and we would not be um, voting on anything final tonight. So there would be further discussion. And so with that, I will ask my colleagues if you have comments or questions, or it, we, in the meantime, we can open up to audience staff. If not, so go ahead, Katie. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Janet, for explaining some of your thinking. I mean, I think it's worthwhile about thinking about broadening it now. I understand your point about, you know, sort of starting small and waiting, but I do think we've, you know, heard a lot, and especially with the non-binding resolutions at town meeting about the request for, um, a, a group um, or a committee um, in town that is dedicated to, you know, more broadly protecting our water resources and, and offering advice and support to the selectmen. And um, I think instead of ending up with two different committees, um, as you point out, it's it's often hard to recruit people for committees. And so it seems to me it, it would make sense at this time to really think a little bit more about broadening RAC's charge. Um, and then I just had some, you know, I guess a question about, I mean, the, their activity is to create and disseminate, you know, impartial um, information. And I, you know, I wonder without staff support or things like that, you know, who's kind of the final arbiter of okaying their um, brochures and presentations and things of that nature. Um, because I, I do, you know, those are things that it, it seems to me like it would be worthwhile to have staff or, or other experts look over. Um, you know, again, I the the sort of kind of professional training or experience you require um, in here, I think, is good for the membership. But you know, that can always vary somewhat. And you know, I I just think sometimes committees can you know create good things, and sometimes they can create things that you know maybe aren't aren't necessarily the direction of the town. And if it's going to be something that has our seal on it or sort of coming out and saying this is what the town of Acton believes and is impartial and and you know objective and whatever, I you know I I hope that there's some sort of staff or you know BOS involvement in okaying that um, and then I also I, I wasn't sure about the need to put in the meetings and administrative positions I mean those are just requirements of all of our committees and it didn't you know I didn't think we needed to say specifically that RAC has to you know comply with our bylaws and state laws and open meeting law because all committees have to so I it, it just felt like we didn't you know we didn't kind of need to call them out on that when we all have to do that, and we haven't put that in recent other charges, as far as I can remember. But yeah, I think it's worthwhile to think a little bit more, and you know, maybe play a little bit with kind of expanding that um, that purpose, and and thinking about who who would approve their you know kind of outreach activities. 
Peter, you have anything? Joan? I think the charter charge should be expanded. Okay. You know. Okay, it looks like no more board comments, audience members. Hi, I'm Kim Castens, 294 Pope Road. And uh, first of all, I'm really glad to see that you're going to be rejuvenating um, the water resources advisory committee, but I have some problems with the charge as it's written. Um, and I'd like to make three points. And the first is about the purpose of the committee, which is written as um, public outreach and education on issues pertaining to water resources. It's my understanding that uh, education and outreach is actually a mandated requirement of the town under the National Pollution Discharge El Elimination System. And it's my feeling that it is not appropriate for the town to be outsourcing a required, a mandated um, requirement under this kind of a permit to a volunteer committee and expecting the committee to do this work in their spare time. So our country has a problem with um, underappreciating education and undervaluing educators, and I see this as a case where that's coming into play. Uh, you wouldn't ask, you know, if the town had legal work to do or accounting work to do, you wouldn't say, well, you know, we got a lot of good lawyers and accountants in acting, let's get some of them on a volunteer committee and get them to do our work. And you shouldn't do that for our educators either. If this is truly something that the town is required to do, it should be somebody's day job and a volunteer committee can be offering advice and guidance and ideas and insights, but this job should not be outsourced to a volunteer committee. Education and outreach is a profession that requires uh, training and education that should be respected. So my second point has to do with the charge calls for the members to have professional training and or experience in water-related sciences and engineering, water resource management, compliance with federal and Massachusetts water protection laws, or public education about water resources. So this is a high level of expertise that you're asking for, and yet the charge as it's written doesn't give these professionals any opportunity to make use of their expertise for um, identifying challenges or opportunities or solutions. And I don't think that you would be able to get serious professionals to, work, to volunteer to be on this committee with such a limited and restricted charge. So, you know, the way the charge is written, it looks like these professionals, these water experts, sit around until somebody asks them a question. And, you know, that may never happen or happen very rarely. Um, basically, um, well, you know, I'm sort of new to the town, and so I look to see what, you know, other advisory committees are being asked to do. And this charge is much wimpier than um, the charge to other advisory committees. So if we look, for example, at Transportation Advisory Committee, they're given the charge to coordinate local transportation planning efforts. They're given four substantive areas of responsibility, traffic issues, bicycling issues, pedestrian issues, annual appropriation requests. And most importantly, the, this committee is expected to take a proactive as well as a reactive role in dealing with these issues. The charge that you've written for the Water Resources Advisory Committee is completely reactive. It has no proactive components at all. And um, if there's you know, no questions arising from the board, as it's written, the Water Resources Committee has no opportunity to speak on behalf of the citizens of Acton in concerns having to do with water. So the third issue has to do with the absence of any mention of the Article 26 uh, water study. So that was approved by you guys and voted for unanimously at the town meeting. So if RAC has no role in this effort, then who are you thinking will speak for the citizens of Acton in implementing this critical study? So I don't believe that it can be left up to the Water Resources District. There, um, they have a different set of priorities that is not perfectly aligned with the citizens of Acton. They're in the business of selling water. And although there's lots of overlap, there's some underlap as well. Somebody needs to be speaking with expertise about water on behalf of the citizens of Acton. And RAC is the natural group to be doing that. That should be part of the charge. Thank you. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Um, I'm hoping to find out from each of the selectmen if they read the proposed charge from the people that um, are proposing doing the work. Because I, as a management consultant, I find that 
when the people who are going to do the work make a proposal about what work it'll be, then the work is awesome, and as opposed to somebody dictating what they might do. So I feel like we need to attract these wonderful professionals um, that are working on their spare time, and everything Kim said I agree with, and I'm glad that she spoke so eloquently. But I would like to know whether you've looked at the actual proposed scope um, and compared it to what Janet has proposed instead. Um, and perhaps maybe take parts of that and ask Janet to include them in the proposed charge. Um, thank you. Thank you. You're right, Janet. I wasn't planning to be here tonight. <laughs> I excused myself from uh, a water district meeting uh, after I finished my business. So I could come here tonight because I wasn't sure if uh, Kim w was going to make it. Um, but she said most of the things I, I, I think I was going to say. Um, you pretty much ran down the history of, of, the, um, of the RAC, of which I, I am a member. Um, uh, the RAC was diverted to a number of things. Uh, it started working on sewers, impervious pavement, um, and then it was asked to draft two bylaws because of the uh, impending doom and gloom that was about to wreak havoc on, on us because we hadn't done uh, due diligence in creating the bylaws that the EPA requires us to have in place as we are one of the seven states in the District of Columbia that is governed directly by the EPA as far as uh, water regulations. Um, we are not self-regulating like our neighboring states and New York State. Um, I've got to say, after I read the draft, I was extremely disappointed. It's, um, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it without being critical, but I've got to tell you, the, um, well, first let me start at the top with echoing something that Kim said, and that is that it is the responsibility of the town of Acton under the NIPTES permit, the current NIPTES permit, um, to do all the dissemination, public objective, impartial presentations, that is the current. The new NIPTES permit is gonna quadruple the town's responsibility. So it's essentially marketing communications. Maybe you need to have a marketing communications committee of professional marketing communicators. I don't think that's the kind of work that any of the types of people that you've listed here would want to do. They're not marketing communications people. I have marketing communications people working for me to say what I want to say. I don't do my own because I'm not good at doing my own. That's not my job. I'm not trained to do brochures. Next thing is the, the quote, the authorized activities are really not that of an advisory committee, one that should be advising the town on water resources. To me, they look like that of a go-fetch committee. I'm not sure the kind of professionals you, you've listed there are going to do go-fetch things. They want to have goals, which leads me to the overall arching thing that I don't believe, and I don't mean this critically, I don't think we have goals for water resources. And that's the first thing I think that's got to be laid in place. You've got to have overarching goals from that, you develop your strategies, then you develop your tactics, and then you measure the tactics to see if they've been successful. That's how a business operates. That's how I've been taught to operate. I was sent up here and wound up up here because my employer sent me to business school in Cambridge. And that's where I learned my how to organize a business. The town should run the same way. It has to have overarching goals, and then there can be a discussion of what our strategies to, should be to reach the overarching goals, develop the tactics, the behaviors that are measurable behaviors to reach those goals. And then you put in measurements to see how successful a group or a committee or a person has been. That's the way successful businesses do operate. I've gone through many, many case studies and virtually every successful company has operated that way. Uh, One thing I, I do have to say, I do remember that when the RAC began its first, uh, what I would call a diversion, 
uh, to uh, draft the first bylaw that the EPA required us to draft. The RAC did try to hire a consultant even at, during that first bylaw. And I remember that the chairman told me he was turned down. Now, you may not have been the liaison at that time. I, I, I can't recall who it was, but the message that came back was that no money was available and you need money to hire a consultant. But I think the RAC did try to hire a consultant. I just don't remember all the specifics at that time uh, because uh, there are some times when you do need outside help uh, to, to draft bylaws because I don't believe, as far as I know, that anyone on the committee was trained to draft bylaws. Uh, and so the best they could do is look around and find, quote, model bylaws uh, and, and try to modify that. And I think that is what was done uh, in lieu of having enough money to hire a, a, a consultant that does this on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Perry. Anybody else? Comments? Well, I think what I will propo I'm proposing to do is I will go back to the drawing board, and if you have any suggestions, board members, um, uh, other than the ones you've uh, shared right now, then uh, let me know, um, and I will add them to the draft. Um, as I said, this is not a final version, and. Frankly, I was fiddling around with the draft so much, I was adding, taking away, adding, and I just said, okay, I, I don't have time to deal with this, so I'm going to just put it in the packet and, and see what happens, and uh, yeah, and, and this is what happens. So, I mean, I think this is helpful to hear from everybody uh, because uh, it gives me a sense of where, where people want things to go. By the way, Barry, I'm, advisory committees uh, created by the selectmen are advisory to the board of selectmen. They're not advisory to the town. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean that's something that uh, people need to understand is, is uh, you know, and, and some, maybe a little more clear in some of the charges that they're, because the selectmen create them, create them, they're usually for a purpose that the selectmen needs, right. deems important. So um, really, uh, if you want to go and advise the general town, it really is under sort of with the, the tacit or express okay of the, the selectmen. That's the sort of thing. It just, I just don't want there to be a situation where there's an advisory committee that's at odds with where the board of selectmen is. It's just, that's, it's not, and I know that there's a, there's a hope that the, the committee can at some point become a, a permanent, um, which would probably be, require the adoption of a bylaw um, to have it become a standing committee with its own bylaw, that it would be uh, responsible for adhering to and, and enforcing, so, I, but. I don't think the committee ever had, uh, and again, I'm not speaking for the whole committee, I don't think I had ever heard that they were looking to advise the town. I think the committee understood it was advising the selectmen and was advising the selectmen. Yeah, no, it, it didn't work. I, I, but you were just, you were just saying, you just said that advisory committee, a committee that's advisory to the town, and, and I didn't know whether you meant, like, town meeting or town, general residents or if you were talking that town and, and meaning board of selectmen so but that's fine no we'll revisit this um, at the next meeting so thank you yes uh, Tara Fredericks West Acton I've hung around with these guys for a while and I never heard them ever say that they were thinking of advising the town they always spoke as advisory to the board of selectmen you know, and I think it's really valuable to have them advise you uh, and be proactive and say, hey guys, there's this thing coming up that's important that we need to um, be aware of and that if we don't have them be that proactive, then we'll miss stuff, and, which has happened too often. And I think that I look forward to, um, I love the scope of work that they had and I would be so happy if they were willing to engage in it <laughs> because it's a lot of free labor. And so I hope you revisit the scope of work that they drafted. Thank you. Thank you. So, motion, I think motion we're done. to adjourn. Yes. Is there a second? Or shall we stay here all night? I'll second that. Okay, Thanks, Katie Peter. Moves and uh, Peter seconds. Any further discussion? <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. Thank you. Good night.